Hello, my name is Dr. Susan Robbins, and the class is Drugs and Society. Say hello to the future viewers. Class, hello. come on, use the microphones. Hello. One more time, hello. Hi. Okay. Okay, we have a wonderful lecture today. All of the lectures, of course, are wonderful, but this is particularly wonderful. Um, Dr. Malcolm Skolnick is going to be talking about some neuropsychology, neurophysiology of the brain, and also the economics involved in drug use and abuse. Um, as an introduction, um, Dr. Skolnick and I met many years ago. He's going to tell you about how we met the initial meeting. Um, I joined a class that he and several other people at the medical center were already teaching on, on drugs in society. Um, he comes to us with great credentials. He has a degree in theoretical nuclear physics. Is that correct? That's correct. Theoretical nuclear physics, which I don't even understand, but he does. He has a law degree, so he's worked as a nuclear physicist. He's worked as a patent attorney. Um, I just learned today that he also worked on the Peace Corps and several other places. He was teaching at the medical center. Um, and he has been a constant lecturer in this class. And he invited me to join their class, which eventually became this class. And he's going to be taught. And you've also, he's also done research on smoking cessation. So he comes with a varied background and wonderful credentials, and he's a wonderful speaker. So please welcome Dr. Skolnick. Well, thank you, Dr. Robbins. I appreciate that gracious introduction. Um, I wasn't in the Peace Corps. I did Peace Corps training, uh, which has all of the hard work and none of the rewards, it turns out. Uh, this class is probably about 25 years old. We started at, at the Graduate School for Biomedical Sciences at the, uh, at the Medical Center here. And I think it was the first year that I taught it, I was looking for some guest lecturers. And I heard about a professor in the School of Social Welfare who was very uh, uh, up on treatment and uh, treatment modalities and treatment effectiveness, uh, Dr. Robbins. And so I called her and I asked her if she'd appear as a guest lecturer. And she said, well, sure. I told her where to come, how to get there, no problem. And um, it, it was fairly near the beginning of the semester, so uh, I didn't know all the students that well. And uh, we all gathered in a, a big seminar room, about 20 people, uh, and myself, and I think I had another faculty there with me. And uh, this young lady came in with purple hair, carrying a guitar case, wearing sandals. I thought, oh, it's another student. So I said, please have a chair, and so she did. And I said, we're waiting for uh, our guest lecturer, Dr. Robbins, to appear. And she just smiled. She didn't say anything. And we waited a few minutes. And uh, I said, well, I, I wonder if I'd better call. And finally, she stood up and she said, no, I'm Dr. Robbins. And I thought, oh, OK, what a nice surprise. And the first thing she did was get her guitar out of the case and take it up to the front of the room and sang a song that she said she had written, especially for the class, the title of the song being, just say no to Nancy Reagan. <laughs> and uh, it was an enormous hit. And, I, and all the successive classes, I never quite managed to get to that level again. Uh, so I was very grateful to her. Well, um, this is a class on who does drugs, what's the consequence, what drugs are, are used, why do they do it, uh, what happens, how much money is involved, and who gets it, among other things. <coughs> Also, uh, I guess most of you have your name cards out. Uh, this gentleman doesn't, and uh, let's see. Don't see, well, I can't quite see yours. Christina, OK. And everybody else is good. So uh, please interrupt me if you have questions, or if you want to make a comment, if you uh, disagree violently uh, with anything that I say, or if you want to add support. That'll always be welcome. The uh, information that's on the uh, slides uh, is intended, one, to convey uh, support for the, the talk that I do, as well as give you information that you can use to look things up. A lot of the stuff that's here, I pulled right out of Google. Uh, and uh, you can do the same thing if you want to look up a particular topic. Uh, the keywords that you can get from the titles of the slides or some of the words in the slides will take you right to uh, a number of uh, very useful and very informative kinds of, uh, of offerings that you can get that way. You have to be a little bit careful. Um, nobody uh, apparently posts stuff on Google without a fair amount of, uh, of bias or prejudice or uh, ideology. 
uh, and I, I want to try to be as neutral as I can in presenting this uh, without betraying my particular biases. That's not what I'm supposed to do. I'm, I'm not supposed to leave you with a particular feeling. I'm sure you all have those. Uh, I'd like to try and make this as balanced as possible. Uh, if you feel that I'm getting a little bit out of line, you can probably correct me. We, I did this one year when one of the students in the class was a former member of the DEA. And that gentleman took exception with just about everything that I said. And his favorite comment is, that's not right. <laughs> You've got that wrong. It's almost like Joe Wilson uh, uh, yelling out in the uh, address by President Obama saying, that's a lie. <laughs> well, not, not really. So there are a number of questions about drugs. Who takes drugs? What do you think, Sarah? Who takes drugs? Everybody. Everybody. For lots of different reasons. Allison, what, what are some of the reasons you think people take drugs? Uh, to cope with pain. Cope with pain, yeah. OK, what else? Mm, for relaxation. Relaxation. Floor, any other reasons that you can think of why people take drugs? For fun. For fun, okay, that's a good reason. If if it doesn't get you into trouble, of course. And Christina, what do you think? Why, why do people take drugs? Um, for allergies and such. Sure, allergies. Almost a thousand, or more than thousands, of different reasons. Uh, lots and lots of medical conditions that are benefited by taking drugs. Some that are worsened by taking drugs. And of course, when people do it for fun, um, sometimes that causes difficulty, which is one of the subjects we're getting at. What kind of drugs are there out there? At this point, you reach for the big book and say, well, <laughs> here's a list. <laughs> Thousands of different drugs. Uh, we'll mostly concern ourselves with uh, uh, the psychoactive drugs. We'll get into that in just a moment. Why do people take drugs? Well, we've had some other reasons. If you're in pain, that can help. Have a headache, help get rid of it. Have an allergy, it can alleviate the symptoms. Uh, if you have uh, vitamin deficiency, that can help. Lots and lots of reasons. And of course, one of the principal things we want to worry about is what happens when you take drugs. Well, the symptoms may be relieved, or a physiological condition can be remedied. Uh, if you have an infection, you can get rid of it. Uh, or if you want to get high, there are lots of ways to do that. There's a question, which drugs are the most addictive? And I'll ask you this again, uh, and we'll go into it in more detail. It may surprise you. Then the question, and this was started even before we got into the room today, a couple of the ladies out in the hall. Uh, I think it was, was it you, Monica, that said, why is marijuana illegal and alcohol not? Good yes. question. We have to talk about that at some length. How many people are killed by drugs? And we'll go into that in some detail. Lastly, what are the consequences of the war on drugs? And there are consequences across the whole spectrum of our society. The political, the social, the economic, the medical, etc. So what are drugs and what do they do? Well, the simple definition of a drug is uh, any chemical substance, whether it's natural or synthetic, which can be used to alter perception, mood, or other psychological states. It also should say physical states, which is sort of the object of the, of the second paragraph. And I'm sure everybody is well aware of that kind of definition. So it's a very, very broad definition. The physician's desk reference is a very useful reference for you. Um, you can get it at pdr.net. It's a compilation of virtually every drug that's made and sold uh, legally, and it's descriptions of some uh, drugs that are semi-legal in the sense that they only can be used medically. It's put out by the pharmaceutical manufacturers. And basically, it's a list of the, uh, the kinds of warnings that they put into various packages, which I'm sure you've all seen. Uh, I was looking for an example of the package insert, that's what they call it, that goes with some drugs. For another class, I was teaching on um, issues that related to the law. And I happened to get a package insert from a birth control pill. And I'd never seen one before. And I started to open it up. And I opened it up, and I opened it up, and I opened it up. And it turned out to be almost two and a half feet square with three tiny print. And I started reading it. And it was like reading a law book. 
what they put on those package inserts is the result of any case that's ever come up that might concern them to try to avoid any liability that you get from using the drug. So drugs don't come to us just as, uh, as beneficent providers of, of good feeling. They can have really serious, dangerous, and sometimes lethal side effects. And the manufacturers walk that very narrow line. Uh, unfortunately, the illegal drugs don't come with package inserts. So you don't know what you're getting. You don't know what the side effects might be. You don't even know what the dosage should be because you don't know what's really in it. You know, is it some baby powder as well as the heroin or what? Or the cocaine, I guess. Uh, okay. Another useful source for you is uh, the National Institute for Drug Abuse as part of NIH. And uh, there's the website. Uh, do, do you all have access to this uh, PowerPoint at some point? So you can all get it. You can re refer back to this. I don't need to go in great detail. But uh, here are, are, are four titles that are particularly useful and pertinent to this class. Drugs, Brains, and Behavior, The Science of Addiction. Very, very well written. Very easy to understand. Lots of good references. Principles of Drug Addiction Treatment, a research-based guide. That could come in very handy if you get into this field and you have to do stuff. Uh, preventing Drug Abuse Among Children and Adolescents. Uh, and they keep that up to date. It's really quite a good, uh, quite a good compendium. But again, it's, it's quite one-sided. You know, these are people in the government who work for the government, which is the principal uh, conveyor of the war on drugs. So they have to hew a particular line. Uh, and uh, about every other sentence is a militance against some of the illegal drugs that they are trying to get people not to use. So who takes drugs? Well, everyone, as people have said. We're all very accustomed to using pharmacology for a large variety. Aside from drugs we take as medicine, we're going to focus on the psychoactive drugs. So we take them for relief of pain, relief of allergy. Somebody mentioned that. We lower cholesterol with drugs. Uh, we, have, uh, we get relief of menstrual symptoms. We lower fever. Uh, we relieve nausea. We improve nutrition. We stop infection. And the list goes on and on and on. Oh, the last one is to get high. Or sometimes to get low, because not all drugs are stimulants. Some drugs are depressives. I think I skipped one. The psychoactive drugs uh, act in a variety of different ways. Some are just anesthetic. Some are painkillers. Some are psychiatric medications. And then there are the recreational drugs, most of our focus. And of course, there are drugs that are used in ritual and spiritual use. Four different groups, depressants, alcohol, hypnotics, volatile solvents, uh, paint, for instance, which people huff, as I understand it, and nicotine, which uh, can be a depressant. And then there are stimulants. You start off with nicotine, and you ask yourself, or me, how can nicotine be both depressing and a stimulant? Well, it is. And that's because nicotine, a very complicated drug, acts in various uh, uh, portions of the brain in different ways. A light dose of nicotine uh, binds to a certain set of receptors. We'll talk about that in great detail. And a heavier dose tends to bind to those receptors and others. So the first effect that people get when they smoke is a stimulative effect and then a depressive effect. And uh, people use nicotine in a variety of ways. They use it to cope with stress. They use it to cope with excitement. They use it to cope with depression. They use it uh, as a, a sort of time-filling mechanism. You don't know what to do with your hands, so you light a cigarette. And of course, you get the benefit from the nicotine. Unfortunately, while nicotine may have some good uh, results, it comes with thousands of different other chemicals in the smoke that are very, very injurious. In fact, they're lethal. They cause uh, lots of different kinds of cancer and irritation, and uh, they lead to a number of serious illnesses and death. The other, the last, uh, Groups are opioids, uh, morphine, heroin, et cetera, and the derivatives, and of course the hallucinogens, uh, PCP, LSD, and those. And the kinds of feelings that come with uh, these drugs are, um, for some people, a moral issue. It's wrong to take those kinds of drugs. Now, you're, you're thinking, what about alcohol? I can see, I can see you thinking that. Uh, well, alcohol has some of the same effects. It's a depressive effect, and it affects the brain in very peculiar ways. It's also a serious uh, medical problem. Alcohol wrecks your liver. 
uh, among other things. Uh, people die from cirrhosis and lots of other diseases that alcohol induces. Uh, but we don't see people making alcohol as much a moral issue as they used to. Of course, at one point, we did, and I'll talk about that. So we're going to talk mostly about nicotine, alcohol, the opiates, cocaine, marijuana, a little bit about methamphetamines, and, and we'll mention benzodiazepines. This is not a complete list, but I, I couldn't get them all on the screen. They're in the text, and you can get them on, uh, on Google as you, as you might very want, want to. So now let's get to the brain uh, and the nervous system. The brain, it turns out, is an electrochemical computer with vast memory and enormous processing power. And I'll explain the electrochemical shortly. The nervous system uh, is both uh, the peripheral and the central divisions. Peripheral is these things, and this is central. The brain and the spinal cord comprise the central. The basic element, the basic unit of the nervous system is a cell called the neuron. And it, it's what makes everything it, it work. The neuron is supported with lots of other cells uh, that provide the structure and uh, also provide various ways to nourish it and replenish it. But the neuron is the basic uh, single memory, thinking, processing unit that makes us what we are. The brain has 100 billion neurons, thereabouts. Uh, less if you drink alcohol, because alcohol tends to destroy neurons. You might think, I have 10 billion of these things, why, or even 100. Why do I have to worry about losing a few? Well, maybe those are the few that you need. So here's a picture uh, of a neuron. Um, Okay, I'm going to go over to the thing and, and point. Uh, well, let's see. Maybe, is it better if I do that one? You, you can do it on that. When, when, you, when that's up, yeah. showing you. They're only showing that. Okay, so this is the best one for me to point at? I think you can point. You can't but, see you and yeah. the PowerPoint. Yeah, you're like, if you're pointing at it, like, we'll be able to see it, but the people at home, when they watch okay, the I'll, video, I'll they'll just see that. I'll stand off. off well, maybe they'll see my hand. No. It's either me or the PowerPoint. All right. For our benefit, you can point at whatever. OK, I, there's, another, there's another way I can do this. Um, there's another way I can do this. It's not as elegant, but this is the dendrite right here. And that's the, uh, the element that uh, receives signals from other neurons. Here's the cell body where the working elements are, uh, are contained. This thing is the axon. And that's what conveys the electrical signal started by uh, the neuron's activity to another neuron. Uh, the myelin sheath is important because it helps propagate the electrical signal. And here is the axon terminal, or a lot of axon terminals, where uh, neurotransmitters are emitted to, con uh, to be conveyed to another neuron. <coughs> uh, let me go back to, where is it? This. OK. So I said the brain has 100 billion neurons, give or take a few. And each neuron can have uh, from 10 to 1,000 uh, connections with other neurons. So if you, if you want to think about the connectivity paths, there can be trillions of them. And it's that complexity that gives us the ability to write music and poetry and appreciate a sunset and uh, write love notes to our dear ones uh, and, and, and think of, of more and better ways to kill each other. That's what makes us smart. Uh, it was what makes us perceptive. It's what mo makes us have moods. And it, it what leads to us taking drugs occasionally to change those moods. If uh, our brains are abnormal in the sense that some of the cells are mutated or we don't have the right chemical balance, we can suffer terribly. We can have awful depression. We can have uh, what, what used to be called manic depression or bipolar disorder. We can be schizophrenic. And it all depends on the brain's electrochemistry. Okay, here's another picture of uh, a neuron. 
and it shows you um, the endpoint of the, uh, the dendrite and what's called the synapse. What you want to think of is uh, a lot of cells connected to each other. Each cell is semi-independent, and the way they communicate is by first sending an electrical signal to the end points that, where neurotransmitters are emitted. These are chemicals that cross a gap called the synaptic gap. They then get taken up by the receiver on, of the other neuron, which then sends an electrical signal, which sends an electrical signal. And I'll show you a little bit how that works. Let me ask you all to stand up. Okay, now, I'm a lead neuron, and this is a neurotransmitter. And I want, I'm going to give it to this neuron here, and he's going to take it in his right hand and pass it to his left hand, and he's going to turn around and give it to that neuron, and it's going to go all around the classroom. Let's see how fast you can do it. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Go. Okay, what happened is you just remembered, having looked at the list, that you have to go to the grocery store and get milk. And it took those kinds of neuron exchanges to make that happen. Uh, and that's sort of the way the, the, the message gets passed. Another way you could think about this, you can sit down now if you would, thanks very much, appreciate your humoring me, is uh, you can think of a line of dominoes, you know, stacked up, uh, stood up, and the first one goes down and they knock each other down. And that's sort of the, the, uh, the wave-like phenomena that goes across the axon to the dendrite to the receptor and so forth, all the way down the line. And of course, the fact that we have trillions of these things interacting you know, to remember and to think uh, and to perceive and to feel uh, is what makes us, again, what we are. Here's a, an actual picture of a couple of lit up neurons next to each other. And you see uh, the body, the soma, you see the axon with the connection from one to the other, uh, the dendrite and the terminal where the, uh, where the action takes place, and those are neurons prepared to interact. Here's a bigger picture of the end of the axon. Uh, the synaptic vesicles that hold the neurotransmitters, and there are lots and lots of neurotransmitters. We're going to talk about six or seven of them, but there are probably thousands that we don't know about yet. We've, in the last 10 or 15 years, we found out more about the brain, uh, especially the way it works this way, than we did in the previous 200. Uh, we're still learning. We're just at the very beginning. So. Here's the, the electrical uh, phenomena coming down to the end, causing the neurotransmitters to be emitted. They go across the synapt synaptic cleft or the gap. They get taken up by receptors on the other end, which are specially designed. You know, these are uh, proteins. Here's a protein that's a neurotransmitter. Here's a protein that's a receptor. And they come together. They're designed to match perfectly. And when the proteins get together, they reconform. They cause a signal to go inside cause the, another electrical signal to go down the neurons, axon, and, and on and on and on. So think of it as the presynaptic neuron. He was the presynaptic neuron, or I was. And uh, that's the message sender. The postsynaptic is the, uh, is the receiver. And uh, that's the way the message gets carried. Any questions about that? No? OK. Here's another picture um, showing a little bit more detail. Uh, again, the, the, the working mechanism is at the, uh, the synapse, and uh, the emission of the neurotransmitters is what makes it all work. And um, here's a little bit more of an explanation. Uh, as the nerve cell stimulated, it makes this graded potential, which is a, a wave-like electrical phenomena going down the axon. The change in the membrane potential, uh, potential on the axon is what causes the axon to act the way it does. And uh, you can think of the electrical dominoes falling, if you like. And when it gets to the terminal, it releases the neurotransmitter that traverses the synaptic cleft. Here are, again, two neuro uh, neurons in uh, proximity. And you can see uh, the little blue circles are uh, the point where the dendrite meets the receiver. A little bit more detail. One of the important parts of the way this works is uh, neurotransmitter recycling. Uh, the brain's pretty efficient. Once a neurotransmitter's been used, 
uh, eventually the receptor releases it and there's another protein called a transporter that takes the neurotransmitter back and puts it back in the vesicle. And that's very important because uh, if that process is interrupted, you can have an excess of neurotransmitters roaming around, but they, they don't do very much. Uh, or sometimes you can have a deficiency. Another part of this is the, uh, the biosynthesis of neurotransmitters. The brain makes these. It makes as much as it needs or as much as it thinks it needs. And that's very important because if you replace neurotransmitters with something exogenous, like heroin or cocaine or marijuana, the brain says, well, I think I have enough. I don't need to make any because I've done my chemical tests and I have plenty of stuff out there. I don't need to go through biosynthesis, so it shuts down. And then those neurotransmitters, which are exogenous, go away. They get metabolized. And the brain says, well, where are those guys? I need them. I better get some more. And it, the biosynthesis is sort of shut down, so it says, what I'll do is I'll take in more exogenous drugs because I'm not making enough, and it's making me feel rotten. You know, it's making my nose run, it's making my bones ache, uh, it's making my uh, intestines uh, behave really poorly. I'm cold and clammy and I feel horrible, and my mood is rotten. I better take some more drugs, and you do. That's one of the reasons that addiction is so potent. You know, you've essentially turned off or wrecked, sometimes, the brain's mechanism for maintaining homeostasis in the neurotransmitters. The transporter mechanism is interfered with, and the synthesis mechanism is interfered with. And that's sometimes very hard to reverse. One of the things we'll talk about like the next time I'm here is some uh, methods for actually reversing that. Uh, and it can be done, uh, and we're making a lot of progress, we think, in, in doing that. <coughs> so exogenous drugs interfere with the recycling process, and they certainly wreck homeostasis. Uh, for instance, cocaine blockades the dopamine transporter and it produces the drug's euphoric effects, which lasts for a while. By blocking the dopamine transporter, cocaine can raise the level of extracellular dopamine in brain regions involved in the feeling of pleasure. So you feel it for a while until it goes away, and then you have to have more cocaine. One of the problems, of course, is that there's another effect, uh, and that is that the brain gets sort of used to what's going on, and it says, well, maybe I may better uh, demand a little bit more. And so it turns out the first high that you get comes relatively easily. The second high requires more. And by the time you get down the line, it hardly works at all. And that's really disgusting because the withdrawal effects are just as severe. But the high that you get is not nearly as effective. So here's a last drawing um, showing the vesicles with the neurotransmitters, uh, the cleft or the synaptic space, the receptors, and uh, you see the transporter located so that it can take neurotransmitters back after they've been released by the, uh, by the receptors and put them in place. So what happens when you take drugs? Well, I've already said a little bit about that. Psychoactive drugs, and this is for emphasis, compete with the endogenous neurotransmitters and bind to the neurotransmitter's paired receptor. Psychoactive drugs alter the communication between neurons, and that's the basis for what we're talking about. The feedback mechanism regulating the supply of neurotransmitters is disrupted when exogenous drugs disrupt the transporter system. So different drugs bind to different receptors, and we've learned a lot about that. These drugs increase sometimes or decrease the activity of the neurons. You get different effects of behavior, different rates for developing tolerance, different withdrawal symptoms, different short-term and long-term effects. These drugs profoundly alter behavior, and of course they alter the neurotransmitter homeostasis. Any questions about that? Nothing. Okay, good. So some psychoactive substances are able to mimic the effects of neurotransmitters. Others interfere with the normal brain function, as I think we've uh, said enough about that. Dopamine is a very important neurotransmitter, and it affects brain processes that control movement, emotional response, and the ability to experience pleasure and pain. Very, very powerful, and it acts all over the brain. 
Regulation of dopamine plays a crucial role in our mental and physical health. Cocaine and other drugs of abuse alter dopamine function. Exogenous drugs may have different action depending on which dopamine receptors the drugs stimulate or block and how well they mimic dopamine. Another important transmitter is serotonin, normally involved in temperature regulation, sensory perception, and mood control. If you have too little sense of serotonin, what do you think happens? Yeah. yeah you feel depressed. You feel depressed. And uh, did anybody know anything about bipolar disorder? Yeah. I, I've worked with people with bi bipolar, and they, they can um, cycle between, their, their highs are when they're in a, a, like a manic stage, are very, very high, like very euphoric, very happy, although it's scary for people around them sometimes. And then their lows um, are, are significantly lower than what we would normally right. associate with that, and it's depressed and uh, suicidal. So and the highs are higher quickly. and the lows are lower, right, and uh, can lead to all kinds of, of difficulty. Well, serotonin is a very important neurotransmitter, and you might well start thinking of a model in your mind about why that happens. Either there's too much at once, or there's too little. And the brain's regulatory mechanism for an ordinary homeostatic uh, condition is just out of whack. So their neurotransmitter moieties are either disrupted or there's a genetic flaw somewhere. So the synthesis isn't right and the uptake isn't right, the transport isn't right, and something like bipolar disorder results. And norepinephrine uh, and also epinephrine, which is its twin, uh, is a neurotransmitter that doubles part-time as a hormone. Uh, it's emitted both in the brain and from the adrenal cortex. Uh, everybody knows what happens when you get scared uh, or you're terribly excited. You get a, a rush of adrenaline. That makes you stronger, uh, able to leap higher and faster. If you're an Olympian, it's particularly important. As a neurotransmitter, epinephrine and also its, its cousin epinephrine help to regulate arousal, dreaming, and moods. As a hormone, it acts to increase blood pressure, make your heart go faster, constricts blood vessels, and increases the heart rate. So that comes when you're frightened or you feel a lot of stress. The acetylcholine is released where nerves meet muscles and therefore responsible for muscle contraction. Uh, drugs that keep this enzyme from working are used to treat something like myasthenia gravis, a disease of muscle weakness and fatigue, and there are drugs that uh, people take that profoundly affect acetylcholine. There are also drugs that people make uh, as weapons that interrupt the action of acetylcholine and its enzyme acetylcholine esterase, which will cause you to suffocate uh, very rapidly because of paralysis. Glutamate and GABA, which is gamma aminobutyric acid, try and say that sometime if you're high on drugs, are amino acids that act as neurotransmitters. And uh, you can read that as well as I, but they're widely present and they get affected in a variety of ways. And one of the problems with understanding uh, the, the results of addiction and how to treat it uh, are that all of these neurotransmitters, and more that I, I won't be able to describe, get affected in different ways in different people. And so what you think might be a very effective treatment for one individual, and you've seen it work, just doesn't work at all for somebody else. Endorphins and enkephalins are uh, the brain's own opioids. They actually have an opioid-like structure. And uh, endorphins and enkephalins get generated uh, with uh, profound physical exercise. And uh, they can be brought on by a variety of other uh, elements like stressors. Uh, they are just like the opioids. They act exactly the same way, except they are the brain's own chemicals, and the brain doesn't mind nearly so much in making them uh, and, and using them. There's a very important relationship between enkephalins and endorphins uh, and the exogenous opiates, uh, which people take for a variety of reasons. If you take opiates for pain, for instance, to st simulate, simulate the effect of the endorphins and enkephalins, you get pain relief. But the ordinary other psychoactive effects tend to be antagonized. The pain is an antagonist to those effects. If you take opiates to get high, or to alter your mood, or for fun, or recreation, and pain is not there, that's when the addiction comes. And that's, um, 
That's a problem when people want to treat pain, especially severe pain, chronic pain, uh, because if you, if you use an opiate like morphine or even heroin, which is a wonderful drug for pain, it turns out, uh, society n now tends to militate against that. Uh, and uh, I have a few anecdotes that I'll tell you about as we go further on. So ACTH, a very important hormone, also affected by things like alcohol profoundly. ACTH is the, uh, is the hormone that wakes you up in the morning. It's the hormone, uh, when its levels decrease, that lets you go to sleep. Uh, if your sleep cycle is interrupted, ACTH is probably heavily involved. And that's why alcoholics have such a very difficult time with insomnia sometimes. So here's just a partial list of uh, the psychoactive drugs and the neurotransmitters that they affect. And you can take a look at this when you look at the, uh, the PowerPoint later on. So which drugs are the most addictive? Well, what affects addiction? What's the drug? Who's using it? And then you have to look at age, economic background, education, living environment, family strength, abuse factors. What are abuse factors? What, what do I mean when I say abuse factors? Sarah, what do you think an abuse factor is? Um, I guess maybe like when they're using, why they're using, how often they're using. Yeah. And what causes them to use? Mm -hmm. If you get some really bad news and you want to be pepped up, you want to be encouraged, maybe you want to take a drug. Uh, if you're scared, maybe you want to take a drug. If you're hopeless, you know, can't get a job, don't have any money, don't have any prospects, feel good for a little bit, take a drug. Sorry uh, that you came in late. Uh, glad to have you here. Do you have a name tag? Good. Okay. Because I'll be back. <laughs> We were talking before class. Uh, Monica, do you want to reflect that conversation? You said when you're driving around through poor neighborhoods, you saw a lot of bars. What else? What, what else? Is yeah, there? sure. Um, I was just thinking about sometimes when I'm driving around the city, and I, you know, I see myself in a low-income neighborhood. I see a lot of corner stores and bars, you know, within the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But then when I drive around a nice, you know. I guess wealthy area like the River Oaks, I hardly see that. So when I'm driving around the low income neighborhoods, I do tend to see more people drinking alcohol and on the streets smoking and that sort of thing compared to when I'm driving around in a nice neighborhood. So I was just thinking about how maybe economics does play a major role in people or a certain group of people um, using drugs. Why do you think that is? Yeah, Matt? Well, I don't necessarily disagree with you. I think that's true, although I think as you go up the SES ladder, what you see is they're still going to bars, but they're downtown and, <laughs> you know, they, they don't have to be around their homes because they're able to travel to go get their pleasure. And I think the other thing that I would point out, and I don't know if there's any data on this, but my assumption is, let's say that there's more illegal drug use, maybe more alcohol consumption on the lower SES level. But I suspect that that's probably balanced out as you go up with the use of legal drugs mm -hmm. that are prescribed by their doctors. Yeah. Which then had me thinking when I'm um, having sessions with teenagers, if I if I have a if I'm if I'm having a session with one teenager who um, is taking bars, which is Xanax, compared to tomorrow I'm speaking with a student who is smoking marijuana. Now after you know joining this class, I, I'm starting to think like, okay. One is not higher than the other. Uh, than the other, they're both wrong. Even though Xanax is prescription, you know the student is still taking it and is harming her body. So compared to marijuana, they're both pretty much bad. <laughs> they, they are bad. So, and, but society makes it seem like oh, marijuana is illegal, so therefore it's worse to 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 take. You know. Well, actually, use of Xanax without a prescription is illegal too. So. I'm not sure that one illegality outweighs the other, but we're, it's, I think it, you hit on a basic question, which is, is poverty a greater inducer of drug taking uh, than affluence? And uh, you can make both sides of the argument. There's more hopelessness in poverty. There's more despair in poverty. There's more pain in poverty. There may be more difficulty in, with families in poverty. But uh, more affluent uh, people have just as many stresses that uh, come from different directions, perhaps, and they may take a different kind of drug. Uh, poor neighborhoods uh, tend to use a lot of crack cocaine. 
affluent neighborhoods tend to use powdered cocaine. Uh, and we'll say a little bit more about that later in terms of the kind of uh, penalties that come with each uh, and the sentences that come with those penalties. But uh, there are a lot of inductors to drug use. Uh, I, I think if we did more to try to alleviate poverty, get more kids in school and keep them there, uh, make sure that people can get jobs, make sure that uh, money isn't such a constant, terrible, nagging, horrible problem, and that people have reasonable housing, and that children don't get beaten. That might do a lot to eliminate some drug use. We're never going to get rid of all of it, of course. I'm, I'm a hopeless dreamer when it comes to trying, however. Any other comments about that? OK. There are a lot of uh, criteria that determine the strength of ad addiction. Uh, withdrawal is probably the, the leading one. The severity of withdrawal symptoms that are produced by stopping the use of the drug are a leading indicator of how strong the addiction is. If the withdrawal is really severe, you know, if people are really sick, uh, you can be sure that the addiction is very strong. Reinforcement. How much reinforcement do people get from the drug? And I mentioned the reinforcement tends to be decreasing with uh, a drug like cocaine, but people nonetheless keep taking it. Why? Because they remember that first high. Unforgettable. I don't know if any of you ever talked to a, a, a drug user, a serious drug user, about how they feel and why they do it. And you get two different answers. I do it because it makes me feel better, and then it makes me feel worse. And I'm glad the better comes first. Tolerance. Uh, people get tolerant to drugs. Opiates are a, a pretty good example. The first time you take an opiate for pain, it's great. Uh, the third or the fourth time, it's a little bit less. And by the time you get to the bottom of the bottle, with Vicodin or Percodin or whatever it is, it doesn't work so well. You have to take a double dose. The pain's still there, but the tolerance is uh, getting in the way. And of course, there's dependence. And uh, dependence is how difficult it is to get away from the drug. Uh, I've had a lot of experience with people who smoke cigarettes and are, are dependent on nicotine. Uh, remember, I had one lady who was a subject in a clinical trial who uh, told us that she would have 100 cigarettes a day. There would be times when she had a cigarette going in every room in the house. She'd go between the kitchen and the telephone, and there'd be a cigarette in each place. And we did our best to get her uh, decommissioned or uh, to help her break her habit, and she did. Uh, and then she went on a cruise and was in a bunch of people who were smoking and went right back on it. She said, when she came back to talk to us, I just couldn't help it. It's so strong. And if you've ever talked to anybody who's tried to stop smoking cigarettes, I think you'll get pretty much the same story. And it's not just what's going on uh, in the receptors, but it's the whole mood uh, and, and, and coping uh, phenomena. The last one is d intoxication. How much intoxication do people get with drugs? And that's very, very different for different people. Um, alcohol's uh, a pretty good uh, example as a standard. All of you know about the fact that you should not drive after you have had uh, a drink or two of alcohol. Do you know what the legal limit for alcohol is in the state of Texas? What? Uh, 0.08. 0.08 what? I don't know. 0.08. It's called 0.08 milligrams per cent. And that means 8 milligrams are every 100 cc's of blood. So here I stand at 214 pounds. Uh, with a pretty big liver, and uh, if I drink uh, a cocktail or two, uh, I can metabolize it pretty fast. If I don't know who's the smallest young lady in here, all of them petite, of course. Uh, if any one of them drinks and they aren't as big as I am body mass, they might be able, they might get intoxicated far more with the same amount of alcohol. It also turns out that uh, I can hold my liquor pretty well. At least I used to be able to when I was drinking. And uh, I could probably function pretty well at 0.08, or maybe even 0.1. There are other people who can't function at all, even with 0.02. And there's really no good way to quantify that. So the law takes sort of a fuzzy middle, 0.08. It used to be 0.1 in Texas. There are states where they're trying to lower it. And there are uh, places in the world where you can't have any alcohol in your blood without getting penalized. Some of the Scandinavian countries, if you're caught and you have any alcohol at all, they take away your car, and they can put you in jail. 
And that's true for all the other drugs. Uh, many drugs incapacitate you. If you take uh, some antihistamines, depending on your physiology, you can be so drowsy you can't function and drive a car. And in fact, you'll see the package insert that says, don't drive a car or operate heavy machinery when you take this drug. So the, I, I like to think of the, uh, the driver uh, bureau in the future uh, giving out driver's licenses. And they don't just test your eyes, but uh, they test your physico physiological reaction to a variety of drugs. And there, there are ways to do that. Um, and um, they put that on the back of your license so that if you're ever brought over by, uh, by an officer, uh, instead of just making you walk the line uh, or uh, do the nystagmus test or the other things that they do, recite the alphabet backwards, whatever, you know, they do lots of different things, uh, they might just take some blood and say, oh, uh, my little handy dandy tester that I pulled out of my glove compartment shows that you're high on benzodiazepines and you shouldn't be driving. Uh, and it says so on your driver's license. Stick out your wrist, you're going to jail. We're a long way away from that, but it's scientifically possible. So which drugs do you think are the most addictive? Yeah. I think nicotine has got to probably be up there. Nicotine, alcohol. Nicotine and alcohol. Okay. Anybody else have any ideas? Heroin's pretty serious. Cocaine's pretty serious. What else? Everybody agree with Matt? Okay. Anybody want to disagree? Here are some addictive rankings uh, that came or, or that were generated by um, uh, two leading lights in the field, Henning Field and Benowitz. One is at NIDA, National Institute for Drug Abuse. The other is a university professor. Nicotine is the most addictive drug by far. By all those uh, criteria that I adduced before. Heroin is next. Then cocaine. Then alcohol. Then caffeine, which we hadn't talked about before. Caffeine is pretty addictive. What happens if you're addicted to caffeine and you stop drinking it or stop taking it? Anybody know? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Amy, is it Amy or Amy? Amy, Amy is Amy, fine. Okay. You get a headache, I know that. You get a headache, and, and there's some other symptoms as well. Sometimes people have uh, problems with their hearing. You can, you can have vision problems, and, but the headaches can be pretty severe. And the only way to get rid of it is to take a hot cup of coffee and get it down fast, or maybe a double whatever they are at Starbucks. And of course, one of the least addictive drugs is marijuana. Now you can smoke marijuana and never smoke it again and not really feel very much in the way of either withdrawal or uh, any other effects. And you don't get tolerant. The next hit you get is probably going to be about as good as the last one. Freddie, you're looking skeptical. No? OK. And so. Um, at this point, you should start wondering, how is it that uh, the most addictive drug that we know about, and one of the most addictive drugs, alcohol and nicotine, uh, are legal? You can buy them with impunity. And uh, aside from the, uh, the restrictions uh, on your driving or operating machinery with, with alcohol, they're perfectly fine. The only reason you get put in jail is if you get caught maybe your third or fourth DUI offense. But nobody ever got put in jail because well, I take that back. I was going to say nobody ever got put in jail because of smoking nicotine. But given some of the restrictions against nicotine, say in bars and public buildings and airplanes, uh, you can get in trouble if you do it. I was on an airplane, well, maybe, what, when, when the, the ruling first came out. Uh, no smoking in this airplane. Not in the back, not in the lavatory. You can't smoke. And the guy next to me said, do you mind if I smoke? And I said, yes, you can't smoke. First of all, you can't smoke without making me smoke with you, and I'm not going to do that. And secondly, it's against the rules. He said, no, really, do you mind? I said, yes, I do. And he couldn't believe that I would say that. He thought I would be a good guy and say, yeah, go ahead, light it up. So he did. And guess what happened? The stewardess came. Uh, the second in command came. They had him stand up, go to the back of the plane. And he came back, and he was wearing the restrainers, you know, those plastic things. And when, when the plane landed, the police came on and took him off first. So he did get in trouble for smoking. But the compulsion was so strong that despite the fact that he knew that it was, one, prohibited, and two, wrong, he did it anyway. 
And he, you know, he told me, he said, I just, I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. It's just, I gotta have a cigarette. And I said, I, I understand. Nicotine, the most addictive drug, is readily available. And there's really no legal penalty for smoking. There are a lot of restrictions. Uh, nobody in this class is smoking. But 20 years ago, somebody might be. Maybe not in a classroom, but probably in a seminar room. But in the university now, you can't smoke in any building. There are some places you can't smoke outside as well. And that's true of a lot of uh, virtually every public building. Uh, we have changed our behavior with regard to smoking cigarettes and other tobacco fairly profoundly. People still smoke, and it still kills a lot of people, but uh, I think we're getting away from it. That, uh, that's very, very different in the United States than some of the rest of the world. Uh, the 1.2 billion people in China have about a 33, maybe 34 percent smoking rate, far higher than the United States. Nicotine has an extremely rapid uh, uh, route to the brain. Within 10 seconds after inhaling the smoke from a cigarette, the nicotine's in your blood and on the way to your brain, and it zaps right across the blood-brain barrier and starts filling up the receptors which is why people feel so much better after they start puffing. Nicotine acts on a, a several different receptors. I said uh, the first few receptors that get taken up are the ones that cause a stimulant effect, and then it's depressive, calms you down. Light doses stimulate, larger doses depress. Smokers use nicotine to cope with stress, with anger, uh, with fear, uh, with anxiety, and once people learn to cope that way, like using a cigarette, it's very, very difficult to unlearn, which is part of the addictive pattern, which is why it's so difficult for smokers to quit, because they have learned a whole new psychological approach to their lives, and they can't really cope as well without cigarettes as they do with cigarettes. And if you, if you talk to smokers who have tried to quit, you know, that's one of the first thing that comes out. I just need this to get through the day. I, you know, I, I can't deal with my wife, I can't deal with my income taxes, I can't deal with my kids, I can't deal with my job, I can't deal with, unless I have a cigarette. And they've learned that that's the way they cope and it's very hard to get away from. Uh, okay, we're good. Um, you know, can you see, can you go to the, well, I'm gonna try and do this. I'll show you what's going on. I don't know the best way to do this for the class. This is a graph of the nicotine level of a smoker in a day. And you see at the left side, uh, when the smoker wakes up, he takes a cigarette, and the nicotine level in his bloodstream and in his brain goes up. And he doesn't smoke uh, for a while, and then the nicotine starts to go down, but as soon as it gets to a certain level, it goes up again with the next cigarette. And eventually he gets to a level so that it's fairly constant. The average is there over the day. And of course, when he goes to bed, at the very end, you see this decrease. And I tried to make that an exponential, but I'm not a very good artist in PowerPoint, it turns out. Um, and um, that's the pattern that goes on every day, day by day. Uh, nicotine goes down overnight when you're asleep, and then you need to pick it up and get it up to the level uh, when you uh, pick it up the next day. Smokers have uh, incredible ability to titrate the actual amount of nicotine that they take in. If you, for instance, give a smoker a different brand of cigarettes that has either more nicotine per cigarette or less, the smoker will adjust uh, the smoking action, uh, how many puffs are taken, how much inhalation is taken, you know, what's the volume of each inhalation, so that it gets exactly or she gets exactly the amount of nicotine that he or she wants or the brain requires. No more, no less. And it's incredibly accurate, you know, down to uh, a tenth of a milligram. And you know, I've measured this myself in smoker after smoker, and it, it's quite amazing. Uh, just, and they do it unconsciously. You know, they don't even—they they don't have to think about it. The brain somehow knows how to do it. Well, <clears throat> let's turn a little bit uh, to um, some of the issues that get us into illegality. This is something that you might want to look up and read. Uh, Marijuana and heroin are listed on the Schedule I of the Controlled Substances Act. And Schedule I drugs are classified as having a high potential for abuse. No currently accepted medical use in treatment uh, in the United States. And think about marijuana. And a lack of accepted safety for use of the drug or other substances under medical supervision. Cocaine, it turns out, is Schedule II since it can be used medically.
Well, heroin can be used medically as well. Heroin's a very, very good pain reliever. Uh, the trouble is there's so much myth with, uh, associated with heroin as uh, an addictive drug that people are afraid to use it. Methadone's in exactly the same place. Method yes, go ahead. I have a question about the scheduling of the drugs and the, the medical utility of them, I guess. With um, you know states like California, we have so many people... I know they're breaking the federal law, but I mean, you have now a, a very large number of people who are using marijuana medically, and I'm sure recreationally as well. But as far as the medical usage, I would think that they would be collecting data. And I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, is data being collected and is that being used to maybe change the classification? Well, that, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, which we'll go into in, in much greater depth in a couple of minutes. But let me answer it by saying, yes, da data is being taken. But it's not being taken by the federal government. It's being taken by all the people that want to legalize marijuana. Uh, I think the federal government is running the opposite direction. There was a big change. Uh, the Bush administration uh, rigidly enforced the federal laws, uh, even in California, that passed a, a law that said, yeah, medical marijuana is OK. Uh, that was changed in the Clinton administration when Attorney General Holder said, we're not going to prosecute that anymore. California, you can go ahead if you want to. It's still on the books. Congress hasn't changed the law. That speaks to the pusillanimity of uh, Congress, I think, as much as anything. But that's another issue. I promised I wouldn't be, uh, <laughs> I promised I wouldn't voice any bias. Don't, don't, don't you laugh. <laughs> she, she can't stand it. We've had this argument before. But, um, well, um, let me just hold off because I need to say a whole lot more about marijuana, but you've raised a really important point. Uh, and and part, of, part of it is if marijuana isn't addictive or very addictive, and it turns out not to be, if it isn't lethal uh, to the extent that the other drugs are like uh, alcohol and nicotine and, and heroin, et cetera, then why don't we just let people use it if they need to or if they want to? And why do we have such rigid penalties for people that do? Well, uh, we'll say a little bit more about exactly why that is, but, but hold that thought. So here's a question for you. How many people are killed every year by these drugs? Um, let me ask you to guess. How many people get killed by smoking cigarettes and using tobacco and getting nicotine? Yeah. Um, probably... I would say at least half a million. Can you switch to the tablet? Yep. Okay. Okay, uh, Matt, the guess is a half a million. Anybody else have a guess for, uh, for nicotine and the, and the carcinogens that go with it? Hey, Sarah, you have a, a wild-eyed a wild guess? You think about a million. Okay. Uh, Allison, what do you think? Um, I was going to say two million. You're going to say two million. <laughs> this is like the price is right. <laughs> One. Allison, come on down. Okay. Uh, Christina, what do you think? I say a little less than a million. Less than a million. Mm -hmm. So 999,999. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe like... Mm, six seventy-five. Six seventy-five. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see what the answer is. Last year, four hundred fifty thousand. Oh, you've been reading, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. What about alcohol? How many people get killed every year by alcohol? Uh, 50,000. Okay. Let's see. Um, Eric, you haven't said a word, although I've seen you smile a couple of times. I'd say about 200,000. You think about 200,000? Okay, and the gentleman next to you whose name tag doesn't appear. Well, that's Ashley. Okay, good. What do you think, sir? I'm going to go on a hunch and go with 100,000. You're going to go with 100,000. <laughs> okay, I'll uh, give you the answer. 
It's about 100,000, and that includes the 10 or 12,000 people that are killed because of drunk drivers. And uh, the people that get killed by alcohol are mostly people who have se severe liver disease, and of course the people that get outrageously drunk at fraternity or sorority parties uh, whose brain gets pickled and they die because of respiratory failure. Well, what about um, the big two, cocaine and heroin? And you see that I, I tossed in aspirin and Tylenol. Anybody ever die from aspirin or Tylenol? Yes. Go, uh, Amy. Yes, I think um, it has to do with drinking a lot of alcohol and then taking Tylenol. It Can be, right. Liver or something right. like that. I'll tell you a little uh, something you may not know about Tylenol, especially children's Tylenol. Children's Tylenol, it turns out, uh, has to be kept in suspension because it has to be a liquid. You can't take a tablet if you're a two-year-old. Uh, and so they use a solubilizer, which I learned how to say, uh, which is a, a, a chemical called propylene glycol. Let me write that on the tablet. It's a form of alcohol. And uh, if any of you ever put antifreeze in your car, that's what you've been putting in. It's propylene glycol. It's a great antifreeze product. The EPA has very strong rules against uh, the disposal of propylene glycol. You can't spill it on the ground. It has to go to special places. But it turns out it keeps drugs in suspension like uh, the acetaminophen that you find in Tylenol. And so they put it in children's Tylenol. And last year, there were a number of children that died because of poisoning from the propylene glycol. Now, the FDA won't recognize propylene glycol as an alcohol. If you look at their definition of alcohol, it's only ethanol. And why is that? Because propylene glycol is a really big business. Okay. And uh, it's uh, protected by lobbyists and a fair amount of money. And I expect now with uh, Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court and corporate money flowing into the politics, it's going to be even better protected. So cocaine kills about 2,200 people. About 2,000 people die of heroin overdose. Another couple of thousand die because of aspirin and or Tylenol. How many people die because of marijuana? Come on. There you go. Um, let's see. I haven't called on Ruth. None? And how about uh, Claudia? A thousand. Ten thousand. A thousand. A thousand. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Charlene, you haven't said a word. What do you think? Um, I'd probably say less than a hundred, maybe due to driving accidents, possibly okay. driving on, under the influence. Less than a hundred. Well, it turns out there haven't been any recorded deaths due to marijuana. It didn't kill anybody. Now, death is a really uh, pungent, potent statistic and easy to determine. There's no parallel index that I can think of that measures the kind of human misery that comes from drug abuse. Uh, whatever drug it is, whether it's alcohol or nicotine or uh, uh, some of the so-called illegal drugs, uh, anyone who's ever seen an older person hauling around an oxygen tank you know, with the, the breather in the nose, because that person has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease because of a life of smoking. Uh, anyone who's ever known a relative or a friend or uh, even a stranger that's died of lung cancer, uh, lip cancer, throat cancer, liver cancer, uh, kidney cancer, renal, uh, whatever it is, uh, that was induced by smoking uh, knows how painful that can be. And we don't have a, a short term for the kind of misery. We ought to. Uh, I think if people knew more about that, they'd think a little bit more carefully about uh, using drugs. But why are some drugs illegal and some drugs not? Which is a question we've been fighting with and struggling with all the time. Alcohol is not <coughs> illegal. It was at one point for about 13 years in the United States. 
Uh, and uh, depending on where you go in the United States, there are various militant laws about the use of alcohol. For instance, there are some states where you have counties where you can't actually buy alcohol. Other states where you can only buy alcohol in a state-sponsored store. Uh, I'm, I'm originally from the state of Utah, and I knew about state stores. And that even went for beer, which if you're a college student is a little bit of a cramp. Uh, and there are other states where it's pretty wide open. You can walk into a bar and get as much alcohol as you can hold. And of course, that's a bit of a problem because if you leave the bar and you're drunk and you get into trouble or you kill somebody, uh, we now have cases on the books where the bar is equally liable as you. So alcohol has a 10,000 year history, uh, maybe more. We've been drinking alcohol for at least that long. And it has a spiritual value for many religions. Uh, if you're a Roman Catholic, uh, alcohol is part of the, of the ritual. And uh, if you're Jewish, uh, there's a prayer for uh, alcohol, for wine anyway. And uh, that's true for a number of other religions. There are some religions, of course, that absolutely forbid the use of alcohol. The Koran says, thou shalt not drink one drop of wine. <coughs> Strong prohibition. The uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has uh, a word of wisdom that militates against the use of alcohol or cigarettes or caffeine or any other stimulant, even Coca-Cola. Nicotine is not illegal uh, as long as you produce it within the guidelines and uh, you pay the taxes on it. You can sell as many cigarettes or cigars or, or pipe tobacco as you like, uh, at least in the United States. And um, we've never had the same kind of illegality for nicotine as we had for alcohol. But uh, there are people who are beginning to recognize that nicotine and the carcinogens it brings with it are killers. And so we have uh, made cigarette manufacturers put labels on their cigarette packages and say this may be harmful for your health. We have uh, banned cigarette commercials. We do everything we can, or so, so to speak, uh, to keep children from uh, taking up cigarettes even though they think it's cool. Uh, every time someone smokes in a movie, uh, there's generally a to-do. And, and have any of you seen Avatar? Okay. You haven't seen Avatar? My goodness! And you haven't either? Well, it's a great movie. But the, one of the principal characters, a lady, uh, smoked cigarettes, uh, even in whatever it was, 22 or 2300. And there have been a lot of uh, press about the fact that you shouldn't let people do that in movies because it's a very bad example. 30 years ago, that would have never been the case. 40 years ago, smoking, everybody smoked in movies. If you look at those movies from the 1930s and 1940s, everyone has a cigarette, the ladies and the men. Nicotine has uh, at least a 600 year history and was a huge money maker, still a huge money maker. And uh, that was before people realized that it uh, was lethal after prolonged use. Uh, and so sales of nicotine uh, have uh, decreased in the United States, but they've increased in some of the rest of the world, in Europe, of all places, certainly in, uh, in Asia and the Middle East. Smoking is endemic. Morphine is um, semi-legal. You can use it for um, medical uses, but you can't use it recreationally. If you try to get morphine in a prescription for your pain, you won't be able to unless you're in a hospital and they give you a morphine pump. Any of you have ever had a, a surgery and used a morphine pump? No. Well, good. I'm glad that you haven't had that experience. Uh, yes? What, what My is father had a, a knee surgery and he had that pump and he kept pressing it and pressing it. Right. Did he have a knee replacement? I, no, I don't think it was a replacement. I think it was ACL. Just an ACL? Yeah. My wife had uh, both knees replaced, one at a time. And this is a really tough lady. I mean, even when she has a lot of pain, she, she won't admit it. Uh, I used to, people ask me if she was tough, and I'd say, she's tough. How tough is she? If uh, she was riding in a Jeep and they were both struck by lightning, it would be the Jeep that got towed away for repair. She didn't think that was very appropriate, but she knows that, <laughs> knows that I have an odd sense of humor. Uh, so the first time she had her knee done, um, they, they put her on this device which you know, flexes the knee on a repetitive basis. It's, it's driven by a motor. So <laughs> and every time I saw that go up and go down, I would sort of wince. Uh, she didn't care because she had a morphine pump. 
uh, and, and I asked her, I said, you know, this is morphine, and I know how you feel about drugs. He said, don't give me any of that now. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. And uh, she used the morphine pump as much as they'd let her. And about three and a half, maybe four days later, she didn't need it anymore. They were able to give her pills, and she stopped using it. So she didn't get addicted. Pain antagonized the psychoactive thing. She never felt high. She just didn't have the extraordinary pain that comes with having the knee. Later, when she went into rehab and some other pain occurred, uh, she wanted to know if she could get the morphine pump back. I said, I don't think so. We'll have to do with the Vicodin. Um, so morphine can be profoundly useful. Um, I used to work with a, a physician named Stratton Hill who ran the pain service at MD Anderson. And MD Anderson, as you well can imagine, uh, has patients that suffer some of the worst pain imaginable. And he um, ran into all kinds of difficulty because he and his, uh, his staff, the other physicians, uh, would get constant harassment from people saying that they were going to make people addicts by using morphine and other fairly strong opiates. And so he came up with uh, an approach for the Texas legislature, which is the Chronic Pain Act, which essentially says if you're a physician and you're treating somebody with terrible chronic pain, and they're likely to be terminal, say with cancer, uh, you won't necessarily have your license lifted by the, the Board of Medical Examiners in the state of Texas because you prescribe morphine. And it was always a problem. You know, here's a person in a hospice, a person suffering terminal cancer, very, very bad pain. And the physician in the hospice prescribes morphine. Well, morphine produces tolerance. So what happens? You have to increase the dose. So uh, here's a case of one physician who did that, and the pharmacist who's looking at the prescription says, if you give that patient that much morphine, it'll kill her. It'll stop her respiratory uh, center from functioning, and you know, she'll die. Well, no, because she was tolerant, extremely tolerant. She needed that much to relieve the pain. Pharmacist fills out the triplicate form, sends it off to the board of medical examiners, reports the physician. The physician has to go before the board and is in dire threat of losing his license. And that's what the Chronic Pain Act was supposed to correct. It took, oh, I think six, maybe seven years to get the legislature to pay attention and then to get the board of medical examiners to relax enough that they recognized what the Chronic Pain Act really meant. Now, I remember going to meet with the board of medical examiners and presenting uh, a new set of, uh, of regulations that they might want to adopt so that they didn't necessarily ding physicians who were treating patients with chronic pain. Fortunately, we had met prior with the president of the Board of Medical Examiners, a physician, uh, a surgeon, who had just had a knee replaced. We met him in his office. He's sitting there with his leg up on the chair. Right? And uh, we said, we want you to take a look at these regulations. We need your help when we go to the meeting with the BME. And he said, no problem. I know exactly what you're doing, and you're absolutely right. And then he told the story of what happened to him when he came out of recovery from his knee surgery. The nurse came up, and she said, oh, doctor, we're so glad you're awake. Uh, the surgery was completely successful. We're going to give you some Demerol for your pain. And he looked at her, and he said, just tell me where you want your dead body sent. Because if I don't get morphine now, that's what's going to happen. Uh, unless you've been there, it's kind of hard to appreciate what it means. Okay. I hope Stratton Hill doesn't mind me taking his name in vain. Okay. Um, well, we were there, I think. So heroin and cocaine and marijuana uh, started off uh, reasonably legal. You know the drink Coca-Cola? Why do they call it Coca-Cola? Because they started off Part of the mixture was a tincture of, of cocaine. It made people feel really good. Um, her heroin, uh, people recognized as uh, a painkiller, and uh, it made people feel good. Marijuana, the same way. Until the 1930s, maybe the late 20s, and that was a, a period of great upheaval. First of all, in the late 20s, uh, we we'll talk about it in a minute, they, uh, they made alcohol illegal. And they figured that once they could make alcohol illegal, they could make some of the other drugs illegal. But it went further than that. Um, various elements of our population uh, were identified with drugs. African Americans were identified with the use of heroin. And the, uh, the, uh, the racial cant that uh, was put out was, 
you know, this is going to make uh, African Americans uh, very difficult to deal with. You know, they'll become crazy, uh, and uh, and they'll become lawless, uh, and they'll uh, steal our children and rape our women. And you know, that's sort of the the, uh, the rhetoric that was put out. Uh, marijuana was associated with uh, with then Mexican Americans or other Latinos, and the same kind of racial nonsense was propagated. Uh, this makes them crazy. You can't deal with them. Uh, we're going to have to make it illegal. And there was a, a particular man named Harry Anslinger who uh, was, uh, I guess, the, the 30s equivalent of uh, maybe an evangelical. He, he took this up as a moral crusade, and he did everything he could to get state and federal uh, legislatures to pass legislation against heroin and marijuana. He was first successful against marijuana. Um, along with uh, heroin and cocaine and marijuana that were made illegal, there are a lot of other drugs like the methamphetamines, which are sort of a, a more current uh, craze, LSD, uh, which is associated with uh, the, the hippies and the 60s and the wildlife there and Woodstock and all that, and a lot of other designer drugs. And the people figured, you know, since heroin and cocaine and, and marijuana are illegal, we better make these other things illegal too, because they cause some of the same effects. And we can't have kids getting hooked on drugs. That's terrible. Never mind the fact that a lot of the people who are making the laws were themselves drug users, as we well know. Uh, of course, it turned out to be politically opportunistic for people like politicians to say, I'm against drugs. I'm for the family. I don't want our kids getting hooked. I don't want these criminals bringing drugs into our, uh, our cities and our, our homes. That's terrible. We've got to vote against it. Vote for me and I'll make sure that happens. Easy to say. So the history of marijuana and heroin in particular uh, and the, the criminalization that uh, associated with them and that caused them to go where they are starts with racism and fear and fear mongering. But mostly it's protection of corporate profits. And what are the corporations that are involved? Well, it's the people that are making the drugs and selling them. Turns out that if you can make drugs illegal, you boost the market price profoundly. Why? Because there's a lot of risk once drugs are illegal. It's risky to grow them. It's risky to refine them. It's risky to distribute them. It's risky to sell them. And it's risky to use them. And that makes the price very high. It doesn't lessen the demand when you make it illegal. In fact, it might make it even more attractive. People think it's cool to uh, smoke pot or use smack or whatever else they do, uh, at least some people do, and the demand is still there. We have um, a lot of uh, yellow journalism involved. Yes, what? Oh, is it time? Okay, so uh, we are supposed to take a 15-minute break, and when we come back, we'll finish up with a little bit of uh, marijuana's legal history and then get on to the lessons we never learned from prohibition. Thank you very much.
Ah, the green light. Okay. I've probably said enough about uh, marijuana's legal history and some of the factors that went into it. But uh, the thing that struck me, uh, it continues to strike me as I read about this and reread about it and think about how to talk about it, is that there's virtually no element in this of the medical, pharmacological uh, substance that, uh, that marijuana presents. It's uh, a moral issue, a legal issue, it's a, a family issue, it's a religious issue. Go ahead. In, in one of the books that Professor Robbins had us read, it's the, the Sherlin book, um, which I'm on record as saying I don't like the way it's written, but one of the things they point out is... Uh, You've got to learn to really speak up your mind. <laughs> is, right, is that the only kind of medical testimony that was given uh, was by one doctor, and then I, I think the AMA, I don't know if they were speaking through him or sent in a letter, and they were saying, don't make it illegal back in 1937. Yeah. There was, uh, there was a set of voices that uh, advocated not making it illegal. It wasn't necessary to make it illegal. And uh, the motivations came from a variety of backgrounds. There were some people that hated the racism. You know, it's wrong to label a particular group of people with this drug. One, it's not true. A very small percentage of those people or anybody else is using this drug. The labels are wrong. We don't like it because of that. Another group said, this can be helpful medically. And even then it was known that it could alleviate some medical conditions. Uh, and a variety of other reasons, but they didn't take, they, they weren't adhered to, they weren't heard, they weren't absorbed, and they certainly weren't believed. So <clears throat> we've talked about some of the consequences of drug, uh, drug use, relief of pain, allergy, lowering cholesterol, et cetera. Uh, drugs can also kill you, not just the illegal drugs, but uh, legal drugs as well. Legal drugs get abused probably just about as much. You can go to jail, you can lose your job, you can lose your scholarship, or you can be prevented from getting a scholarship if you have uh, any kind of association with quote unquote illegal drugs. You can be cut off from a lot of other further opportunities. Uh, you can lose your family, uh, particularly true of, uh, of heavy addicts who spend all their money on drugs and can't support their family, can't maintain affection, can't maintain relationships, and they lose the family. You can get HIV and AIDS. Uh, and lots of other problems. So the, the difficulties that come with the use of drugs, whether they be legal or illegal, are manifest and clear. And when you talk about this or you deal with uh, your prospective future clients, uh, really important to, to present a balanced view about the fact that uh, drugs are not in themselves inherently evil, but they have some really serious and sometimes really terrible consequences. Well, we need to look at drug uh, use and abuse and some of the economics. Um, talk a little bit about the pharmaceutical industry profits. Uh, those are legal drugs. The illicit drug profits, some of the costs of drugs, and a little bit about following the money. The revenues of the 20 largest companies, pharmaceutical companies, in 2006 were $650 billion. Drug companies the most profitable of any industry. Uh, profitable even more than health insurance, but health insurance comes close. So, I can't. You want it higher? Like this. Okay. Should I speak at a lower tone? Okay. <laughs> you're not gonna you're not gonna get a brownie for that. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's just <practice>. That's a <laughs> that's a Louisiana mosquito. It's it's that big. The net profit uh, in the pharmaceutical industry in the Big Twenty was seventeen percent of revenue. A lot of other industries are, are very happy when they get 3 and 4 percent. And I don't know if you know very much about the way drugs are created and uh, approved and then sold. Um, I was a CEO for a biopharmaceutical company for about 10 years trying to make some new drugs and got heavily involved in the production and the regulatory phenomena associated with drugs. Uh, I learned that the large pharmaceutical houses are really much more like banks than they are scientific uh, development uh, agencies. 
they try thousands of different drugs and they find some that have uh, an effect, maybe a very small effect, but it's enough that they'll put it into a clinical trial and test it on thousands of patients uh, and then put it out. Now sometimes the drug really works very well, like the statin drugs that help lower blood pressure. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work very well, but they put it out anyway because it meets a particular cachet for the market. Uh, there are people that have the disease and they want anything that will help. Sometimes they put out drugs that work, but they also have terrible side effects. Everyone remember the COX-2 inhibitors? Vioxx, for instance? Okay. Well, Vioxx, it turns out, has uh, serious side effects that are far worse than the alleviation that it brings you for your, uh, for your pain or uh, other issues. And uh, Merck knew about that, uh, and it uh, dissembled. It, it hid the data, uh, and it tried to keep it secret. And when it finally came out, there was a multi-million dollar settlement with the people uh, who died because they took Vioxx. And that's uh, unfortunately uh, a fairly prevalent practice. These are corporations, they have shareholders, they look at the bottom line on a weekly and quarterly basis. Uh, if they're not making a profit, uh, heads roll. People lose jobs. Yes, sir? My presumption then with Merck though is that they generated more revenue than they paid out in death benefits. Yes, that's exactly right. And that's a very, very strong point. That's one of the problems with corporate America. You, you see examples not only in the drug industry, but certainly in the automobile industry, where there were calculations uh, for, for instance, uh, the Chevrolet Corvair that, that, sh that Chevrolet knew was unsafe. Uh, you remember Nader's book, Unsafe at Any Speed? Well, that was true. That was what made his reputation. Well, uh, Chevrolet calculated that the amount of money they'd have to pay out in liability claims was less than the profits they'd make by selling the car. So they did. You have your hand up. Is that because you're scratching or because you... This is my hair, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I, I thought you had an observation. Tell us what you're thinking. Okay. The 11 largest drug companies have a total market cap of approximately a trillion dollars. You know how much a trillion is? It's a thousand billion. Ten to the fifteenth. A market cap is the number of shares uh, a company has out times the share price. So if, for instance, you had a hundred shares out in your company and the shares sold at ten dollars, your market cap would be a thousand dollars. If you have uh, five or six million shares out and they're selling for thirty dollars a share, you can imagine what the market cap is. Very, very, yes, sir. I'm assuming part of the reason that the Obama administration cut a backroom deal with the pharmaceutical companies for the present health care debate was so that a trillion dollars didn't get behind defeating it. That's probably part of the reason. The other part of the reason is that um, if 30 million more Americans join the pools, as would happen under the mandates in the health care legislation that's proposed, that uh, the insurance companies would be very greatly benefited and so would the pharmaceutical industry because they'd have that many more people who are buying drugs uh, and with relatively assured payment. And that's probably as big a reason as any. The, the politics are not unimportant. You know, they needed all the support, and they still do, to get that legislation passed. And if the drug industry uh, takes a militant stand against that legislation, so far they've been somewhat neutral, although I have spent money to try and influence some people. But if they really get uh, hot and bothered and they start spending a lot of money, as they now can under the recent uh, Supreme Court decision in Citizens United versus uh, whoever it was, I guess um, the FCC, then um, the drug industry can spend not just millions. They can actually afford to spend billions in supporting candidates that will do what they think they would get benefit from from their business. Okay, uh, the number of the, the drug companies are listed there. Merck and Company and ends with Wyeth. Oh, we look at illegal drug revenue. And um, the first part is that we have a UN report. This was from 2006. It's gotten more since then. That the illegal drug trade generated $350 billion in revenue. That's in revenue. 
uh, in that year, and it's probably closer to 450 billion now. Marijuana is, I think, the second largest cash crop in the United States, and uh, there are countries that depend entirely on the growth of, uh, say, uh, poppies for heroin uh, for their economy. They don't really have very much else. Afghanistan being uh, uh, a singular, singularly good example or bad. Turkey also. Uh, the Latin American countries, Peru, uh, Bolivia, etc., grow cocaine. It's their second largest export. I'll say more about that in a minute. The drug trade now, uh, 2009, is about 8% of the world economy. That's bigger than cotton, it's bigger than corn, it's bigger than steel, uh, almost as big as automobiles. Very, very big. Marijuana has some good examples. Most of the high-grade uh, cannabis sold in the U.S. is grown in hidden operations indoors. Maybe 20 percent is grown outdoors, especially in Northern California. If you're hiking in Northern California in certain places, you want to be very careful not to get off the path. And if you ever see that five set of leaves, walk away, because th they work very hard to protect that. The number one producer in California uh, produces a revenue about 14 billion. And uh, last on the list is Hawaii, and that's close to 4 billion total in those states alone of 36 billion dollars, and that's just marijuana. Marijuana is becoming more and more accepted for medical use. Uh, here's an example of uh, uh, some of the, the statutory language in Michigan, uh, which was passed in November of 2008. Mi Michigan is one of 14 states in the United States that now has passed legislation that allows some form of use of medical marijuana. California, Iowa, uh, let's see, Colorado, and others. You can look that up if you want. Um, the feds had, as I said before, a policy, a strong leg legislative uh, uh, mandate for uh, enforcing laws against marijuana. They don't do it now. They don't do it in California or any of the other uh, 13 states. Marijuana, it turns out, can be very helpful in uh, dealing with several medical conditions. We'll talk about that in more detail in just a moment. We're looking now at heroin, the world's illicit production of opium which comes from poppies, is uh, about um, 1.2 million metric tons. What is a metric ton? Who knows what a metric ton is? What is a regular ton? 2,000 pounds. So what do you think a metric ton is? 1,000 kilos. kilos. And a kilo is about 2.2 pounds. So a metric ton is 2,200 pounds, roughly, a little bit more. That's a lot of, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of scat. Um, heroin is exemplar, uh, and the other drugs go through the same things. First of all, somebody has to grow the source. In this case, they have to grow the poppies. Then uh, it has to be refined into a sort of syrup. And then uh, an importer gets the syrup and passes it on to someone who refines it and puts it into the powder. And then uh, that's put up in kilogram lots, and it goes to the kilo connection who provides it to the regular connection. You know, it's a whole chain. People are specialized, highly specialized. Then it goes to the weight dealer who says, I've got six keys of, uh, of heroin, and I'm, I'm going to pass it out in northern New Jersey. And that goes then to the street dealer who figures out what the network will be, and finally to the pusher, and finally to the user. And uh, each level runs the risk, and uh, at each level you see the price increasing. The costs of heroin consumption depend on a lot of things. One, the number of addicts, the number of days per year heroin's consumed, and of course, the average cost of heroin per day, which can vary markedly, not only day by day, week by week, but state by state or city by city. Here uh, is a list of retail prices of heroin in various cities in the United States. And these prices are given per milligram, which is the only table I could get. If you want to know the price per gram, just multiply by 1,000. 1,000 milligrams in a gram. So in Boston, for instance, the price per gram would be $530 or $840. Just move the decimal place over three places. Yes, sir? Oh, I mean, <clears throat> what, what is a gram? I mean, for, I know it's kind of vague, but like, say for an average user, is a gram 
what you use in a day, a week? Uh, you probably would use a little bit more than a gram in, in any one dose, and you might do it every couple of days. Uh, and uh, it, the trouble is, it depends on entirely how much of the gram is really heroin. Remember, as it goes through this chain, people cut it with various things so that uh, they increase the, the actual weight, but they don't increase the purity, they don't increase the dosage, or they don't increase the, the amount of actual heroin that's there. So it's kind of hard to know. There's some, uh, a nickel bag, $5 bag, might have a few grams in it. And, uh, or maybe, maybe a gram, sometimes less, depending on the strength. You know, that's why people who are addicts get to know excruciatingly well and in detail you know, which is the best heroin from which source. And they cultivate a dealer that gives them heroin that's reasonably reliable, so they know pretty much what they're getting. You know, and and there, are, there are almost as many varieties of heroin as there are marijuana. Marijuana's gotten to be a lot more potent as people have learned how to cultivate it. You know, they, they pick out the plants that give the best uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, and they grow those and they throw away the rest. Well, that was in 1970, these prices. This is a graph of prices um, starting in 1991 and going up to 2006. And you see that in 1991, the price for heroin was about $317 per gram. The price of cocaine was $215 per gram. Now, uh, heroin's the blue line and cocaine is the orangish yellow line. Uh, and you see the prices uh, have come down and come down and come down until we get to about 2002, which was the minimum, and then they went up a little bit. Uh, heroin has always been more expensive than cocaine. And um, there are a lot of reasons that you might speculate about why that is. Uh, anyone have an idea about why heroin would be more expensive than cocaine? Yeah. Well, I, I think the bulk of it is traveling from a lot further away. Yeah, uh, and heroin has to go through more uh, processing to get to the, uh, the usable powder. Cocaine uh, is a little bit simpler, in both in terms of growing and in terms of refining. Starting with a coca leaf and then producing uh, powdered cocaine or even crack cocaine, doesn't involve as many steps and it's not, probably not as chemically uh, involved, or at least that's my understanding. But you'd really have to talk to a refiner for either one to, to know for sure. But nonetheless, those are the prices. And uh, finally, we see in 2006 that uh, we're paying $71 a gram for, uh, for heroin and uh, $85 a gram for cocaine. Yeah, go ahead, Flora. Why did it go down so much? Well, uh, I, I don't know for sure, but I can speculate that um, people, uh, more and more people got involved. Uh, more and more was available for the market. There was more competition, and as competition increased, uh, the price goes down because you're trying to outsell or undersell your competitor. And um, if you look at the uh, comparison of the price with the production, you'll see the production has gone up, and that, I think, is the main reason for the price going down. And there are also more sources. Uh, it used to be that heroin came from a fairly small region in, in, in Middle Eastern or Eastern Asia. Now it's grown in a lot more places. And uh, while cocaine originally only came from three or four countries in Latin America, now it's spreading. And I think even Mexico started to produce cocaine, yes. Hasn't the potency of at least like heroin also gone up? As I mean, the price has fallen, but the potency has gone the, up. The potency has gone up, and uh, some people argue that uh, the dealers learned that uh, purity was important if they wanted to keep customers. Uh, nothing like an, an OD uh, to kill your market. And so the purity went, I think, up a little bit, and certainly the potency. People learned how to refine it better, faster. Uh, the other thing was that the uh, chain of distribution became. Um, I guess I would say a lot more robust. They were better able to avoid uh, the DEA and some of the other enforcement agencies. So more is getting in, that means a greater supply, and that affects the price. That answer your question? Good. So how do people pay for their habits? Well, here are some of the ways they do it. They shoplift, they uh, burglarize, not much pickpocketing, larceny, a little bit of robbery. Not many confidence games, but prostitution is very, very important in terms of raising money to support a habit. 
Here's an estimate of some of the funds obtained by addicts annually. Property crime, $914 million every year. Prostitution, $457 million. Now, um, the way prostitution works, as I understand it, uh, the prostitute is not herself or himself uh, an independent uh, a business person, but is generally run by somebody else. And most of the profits go to the people doing the running, not the people doing the work. There are legitimate sources for people getting uh, drugs. Uh, there are lots and lots of methadone clinics, uh, which is a maintenance kind of uh, operation. Uh, methadone gives the same relief for people who are addicted, but without some of the same side effects. Methadone also is a pretty profoundly good pain reliever, but you can't use it for that because people are afraid that since methadone is even more addictive than heroin, uh, it would get people hooked. The cost to victims in all of this is uh, excessive. That's 2379426150. That's not millions, that's billions. Two billion dollars. So cocaine, and here's a good place to look at it, for, among others. Cocaine is produced primarily in three countries, Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru. It's Latin America's second most important export after uh, petroleum. Second most important export. The drugs traffickers reap an annual revenue estimated at somewhere between 9 and 10 billion. And that's an estimate. It's hard to get the data. Could be more. Probably not less. Cocaine amounts to approximately two-thirds of all the United States spending on illicit drugs, despite the fact that uh, it has the disparity with heroin. $31 billion of the country's $49 billion retail market in 1993, and it's about uh, a third more than that now. Americans spend more on cocaine than they do on airline tickets, or on gas utilities, or magazines and newspapers or even on public schools in some uh, principalities. At present, a kilogram of Coke will bring $75,000 approximately in the United States, depending on the region, but about $125,000 in Europe, where the usage is uh, increased. One, because of less uh, discrimination, less law enforcement. Anyone ever been to Holland? Yeah, been in Amsterdam? What happens in Amsterdam? Um, well, lots of things happen in Amsterdam. Well, but aside you, from the things in yeah, the canals. But you have um, and, and decriminalization right. of, um, of certain drugs, uh, hashish, marijuana, and um, mushrooms. And I, I'm not sure how it works with some of the harder drugs. That I'd, I w Cocaine's on the, on the edge. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But, I mean, there are also, I mean, it feels very safe, but one thing I notice is there are tons of drug dealers, and they're just out, like, all over the place, usually in black leather trench coats, from right. what I could tell. Yeah. Yeah, even when it rains. Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, Holland has taken a very different approach to uh, drug um, regulation. Uh, they let it be sold and they tax it, or when they can. Sometimes they can't get the dealers, and that's when the dealers get in trouble. Is they're operating illegally. They sell it to you, but they don't pay the taxes, and the Dutch take a very dim view of that. Yes. I thought that was actually really interesting. I, rem I remember someone coming up to me trying to sell me marijuana. Yeah. And I remember looking at him and I asked, asked why, why would I buy marijuana from you and literally break the law when you can walk inside a shop and purchase it legally? And what like, did he, what did it he didn't he make say? any sense, so he just walked away. Yeah. Well, if you're smart enough to understand that, it, you, know, you won't get into trouble in, uh, in Amsterdam or in Rotterdam either, for that matter. Any other questions about that? Anybody want to go to Amsterdam tomorrow? It's a great place. The euro has replaced the dollar in the Western Hemisphere as the currency of choice among cocaine traffickers. Why? Because the, uh, the euro, up until I guess maybe yesterday, was worth more than the dollar. Because of the difficulties in Greece and Spain, the euro has been falling. It was, I guess, about a dollar forty for a euro. Maybe it's uh, probably closer to a dollar in parity now, and it might go less because the problem in Greece ain't going to go away. Uh, they have made some really bad and egregious errors and been profligate in the way they've spent the money. Poor, th poor things. Well, you know, here's a, here's a set of countries that adopted a common currency uh, 20 years before they should have. 
So they don't have the ability in individual currencies to uh, devaluate and cure some of their really serious financial problems. And when you spend money you don't have the way Greece did, uh, you know, you put in all kinds of social programs and you don't pay for them, and you get people very angry because it looks like their salaries are going to get cut if they're government workers, and you have strikes every other day, on and on and on and on. Not much you can do if the euro is rigid and you can't do anything about it. Well, that, sorry, that's not, uh, that's not drugs, right? But I had to say that. Okay, as cocaine use has declined in the U.S. somewhat dramatically, it has risen in the European market. That's probably going to continue. Cocaine is also associated with the increases in assassination, in terrorism, and in subversion. Heroin is equally associated with uh, assassination, terrorism, and, and conversion, or subversion. The Taliban, and more particularly Al-Qaeda, support themselves essentially from copies grown in Afghanistan. You know, that's what buys the weapons, and that's what buys influence, that, that's what buys corrupt officials. You know, that's what allows them to really run their operation. Yes, sir? So that's the case for those drugs. What about something, I mean, you had mentioned that marijuana is also a pretty large cash crop. Yes. Um, maybe not as big as those, but, but big. I mean, is there any data or is it, has, has there been any studies to look at whether you've also had an increase in murder rate because of the distribution of marijuana? Susan, do you have? Okay. Uh, further up. I'm going to it to my chin. No. Okay, how about this? Oh, okay, I don't want to be scratchy. I don't want to be itchy. Um, I don't I don't have any, any really solid data, but my perception is from talking with a number of people and doing as much reading and study as I have, is that uh, marijuana users are a good bit different. God, it's a pleasure to watch a professional at work. I should take this a lot more seriously, I, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> yes, no? No. Okay. I'll tell you what, let's do this. I did because it kept falling off. Could you, you put it in a pocket, possibly? Well, I did put it in a pocket. It was in this pocket. But not that pocket, but lower down. You want a lower pocket. Yeah, because as you turn with the chest, it's rubbing the close. Oh, that probably every time I breathe, it does yeah, something. Just about. That's okay. why we're going. This is unacceptable. Okay. Well, let's try this. If I can. Don't try that. Okay, what do you think now? Perfect. Sorry. Um, so... The big three, assassination, terrorism, subversion, work for uh, cocaine, they work for heroin, and to some extent they work for marijuana, but uh, the marijuana production uh, network is just a lot more uh, extended and diverse. Uh, as um, the cartels, for instance, in, in cocaine production have absorbed more and more of uh, individual activity, and the number of controllers, the number of uh, controlling entities has decreased, which it has, uh, y you tend to get more money concentrated and therefore uh, more gang rivalry and more uh, murder and, and terror. Uh, and what's been going on in Mexico for the past couple of years, for instance, in uh, Tijuana and uh, Ciudad uh, uh, Juarez, right? Uh, and uh, I guess even in Matamoros. Uh, murder is rampant, and that's because of the fights between several of the cartels who are doing everything they can, you know, fang, tooth, and claw, to maintain their control of a particular market, not just of the sources, but also the distribution. Uh, and marijuana is not as, uh, as organized in that way, as, as my perception. It's grown in a lot of different places. You know, you can even grow it in your backyard if you want to, and, and many people do. Uh, also, uh, the, the increasing um, decriminalization of marijuana makes it less uh, a subject of that kind of activity. 
you don't have to go to so many great extremes to maintain your market. One, it's, it's popular, uh, and it may be a different class of people or a different group of people that's using it. it Maybe younger people uh, who can use it or not use it. They can take it or leave it, and they do that. Uh, but they aren't the regular hardcore kind of addicts that you tend to sell to for heroin and cocaine. Anybody else want to comment on that? Okay. Um, the rise of Colombia's cocaine industry, uh, which has been exporting heavily since the 70s, correlates with the threefold increase in murder rate, which is even going up now. Colombia's homicide rate at 78 per 100,000 is roughly seven times the rate in Washington, D.C., which has one of the worst rates in the United States. More about cocaine. A RAND Corporation study for the U.S. Army and the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, which uh, was a report that those people didn't like very much, found out that drug treatment is ten times more effective at reducing cocaine abuse than drug interdiction. That means if you treat uh, individuals who have cocaine addiction medically. It's much more effective in terms of producing a result and getting them back into society than just trying to keep the drugs away. It's 15 times more effective than domestic law enforcement and 23 times more effective than trying to eradicate cocaine as its source. What do those, what do those numbers mean, do you think? I mean, where do they get an idea that something is 23 times more effective? How do they measure that? Yeah. I'm assuming maybe they're measuring the number of people that are using? Number of people that are using and the number of drugs that are available, pretty much, yeah. The statistics are reasonably robust. So we've known for a long time that medical treatment is a lot more effective than interdiction, which means stopping the drugs, or incarceration. Uh, but we keep putting people in jail. And I'll say a whole lot more about that as we go forward. The researchers concluded that for every dollar invested in drug treatment, the taxpayers save an estimated seven and a half dollars in social costs. So in contrast, the taxpayers lose 85 cents for every dollar spent on source control uh, or source country control. That's part of interdiction. They lose 70, 68 cents for every dollar spent on interdiction, that is stopping it before it gets in and 48 cents for every dollar spent on domestic law enforcement, which is an increasing part of law enforcement's budget. In contrast, 1% only of Colombian population used cocaine at least once, compared with over 9% of the population in the U.S. Now that's a much smaller number. Colombia is a much smaller country. In Peru and Bolivia, the figure ranges from 1% to 3%. So why is it that they grow it, they make it, they refine it, but they tend not to use it very much. We don't make it or grow it or refine it, we use it a lot. Why is that? Yeah? Is it illegal there? Well, yes and no. I mean, it, uh, they, they try to say that it's illegal to make it and grow it and refine it, but that doesn't stop them from doing it. And in fact, the people who make it, grow it, and refine it are such a powerful financial influence uh, and a semi-military, paramilitary influence, and a political influence, uh, and a criminal influence that uh, it, it, you can say that it's illegal, but it doesn't count, doesn't work. Uh, if you try to militate against cocaine in Peru or Bolivia or Colombia, somebody's probably going to kill you. So <clears throat> let's look at some history and see if we see some parallels. The Volstead Act was the act that brought in prohibition, which was uh, an act that said you can't sell alcohol and people can't drink it. That was the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, started in uh, 1919. No person shall manufacture, sell, barter, transport, import, export, deliver, or furnish any intoxicating liquor except as authorized by this act. And that included 3.2% beer. And so um, we prohibited intoxicating beverages. And the law became the law of the land. And th some things changed. Some of the effects of prohibition, first of all, the production, the importation and distribution of alcoholic beverages were taken over by criminal gangs. 
Now, is there a parallel that, that we can see there with heroin and cocaine and marijuana? Yeah. Fights between the gangs for market control produced violent confrontations, including mass murder. Well, what have we just been talking about? Enforcement was difficult because the gangs became so rich that they were often able to bribe underpaid and understaffed law enforcement personnel and pay for expensive lawyers. Well, no different now, right? I'm a patent lawyer, so I don't get involved in any of that. So here's a rhyme that came in 1931 in the midst of Prohibition, about halfway through. Prohibition's an awful flop. We like it. Can't stop what it's meant to stop. We like it. It's left a trail of graft and slime. It don't prohibit worth a dime. It's filled our land with vice and crime. Nevertheless, we're for it. Franklin Adams in 1931. So eventually, uh, people were breaking the law left and right. They were going to speakeasies. Uh, rum runners were making a lot of money, bringing stuff in from Canada and Mexico. Uh, Joe Kennedy, former President Kennedy's father, was a one such runner, got rich by bringing in scotch. Nothing but the best. Alcohol was never really out of public favor, even though the people, the, uh, the dries, so-called, uh, made all kinds of moral and religious arguments against it, which is what got it probably repealed in the first place. The effects of prohibition on disrespect for law and the growth of organized crime became apparent. And uh, eventually, the states and then the Congress said, you know, we can't keep having the criminal element increase and get richer by uh, doing what they do with prohibition. So we better, we better repeal it. And they were really more worried about the, the criminality than they worried about the moral or the, uh, the medical issues. The number of deaths from alcohol, well, he's not going to get me, uh, increased markedly during prohibition, not just because of the crime, but because there was actually more consumption. So on December 5th of 1933, the 36th state in the Union ratified a repeal. Uh, they passed the 21st Amendment. Now, curiously enough, that was the state of Utah. The state of Utah is predominantly uh, religiously uh, controlled, run, and, and uh, inhabited by people belonging to the Church of Latter-day Saints, of Jesus, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, which militate strongly against alcohol. But they nonetheless passed that law. Why? Because they recognized they couldn't stand any more growth in criminality. Uh, and one of the things you learn if you're a student in Utah, as I was, uh, eventually the legislature gets sensible once in every 20 years. So they repealed the 18th Amendment, and they made the Volstead Act unconstitutional, and they restored control of the alcohol to the states, which took their own approaches. Some states were very liberal, liberal some states were not. Yes, sir? It makes me wonder if there could be, I mean, like an unholy alliance between folks now who are very morally against decriminalization um, and these large cartels who have zero interest in decriminalization because it would destroy their destroy the market, sure. destroy their business model. If you uh, decriminalize or you legalize any of these drugs, uh, the market, the bottom falls out of the market. Uh, because what you say then is, you know, it's legal. If you want heroin, fine. We'll give it to you under medical treatment, and we'll try to wean you away from it. If you want marijuana, we don't really care. Uh, we might write you a ticket, uh, which is a Class C misdemeanor, but uh, we're not going to put you in jail anymore. The same thing with cocaine. Uh, people are a little bit more careful about the abuse of prescription drugs, which they should be, because sometimes they can be even more dangerous. But you're right. The people who are making money from this do not want it decriminalized or legalized because they make money from it. So <clears throat> the drugs are in transition. Alcohol regained its legal status. Heroin, cocaine, and marijuana became illegal. Here's another rhyme. <coughs> this is uh, people who wanted marijuana uh, and other drugs to become illegal because they were bad. A slinking thing with hellish sting, the reptile known as dope. Its poisoned breath is living death beyond the pale of hope. And in the blight of endless night, its countless victims grope. In stricken homes, the reptile roams on hearthstones bare and bleak. 
ambition dies in youthful eyes, slain by the noxious reek. For dope is strong and prospers long because the laws are weak. So the youth of America is endangered by these drugs. Uh, anyone who gets exposed to a whiff of any of them becomes instantly addicted and crazed. There was a movie in the 30s called Reefer Madness. A bunch of, I guess, uh, probably college students shown going absolutely crazy uh, and having a party with marijuana and then doing all kinds of uh, orgiastic things, uh, which is as much as you could show in uh, 1933 or so. But it was a, a horrifying movie. And that movie was seen by a lot of people who said, hey, we, I, I'm not going to allow my children to get close to that stuff. Pass the law. And people did. So <clears throat> drug profits. There's a huge profit margins, up to 300%. And what that means is that you could lose 90% of a shipment of your drug and still make a lot of money. And that's, you know, people recognize that drugs are going to get uh, interdicted. They're going to get uh, <coughs> stopped. They're going to get confiscated. But enough gets through, one, to maintain the market, two, to grow the market, and three, to make the money that you want to make. Producing drugs is a pretty cheap process. Uh, processed cocaine is available in Colombia for about $1,500 per kilo. And you correspond that with the, the 75000 or so that it costs when you put it on the street. Um, 66000 in this figure. Heroin costs $2,600 in, uh, in Pakistan per kilo. It can sold on the streets here for about 130000 now, whether it's Pakistan or Cambodia or Vietnam uh, or any place on the Golden Triangle or in Afghanistan, that money is a very, very important part of the economy. And people will fight and kill to make sure that they can maintain the source as well as the income. Then there are synthetics like methamphetamine, which are even cheaper to manufacture. Anybody know how you make methamphetamine? Well, first you get Sudafed, which is ephedrine. Uh, and refine it, purify it, cook it. Very dangerous to do. If you breathe the fumes, you can die. Uh, the fumes are extremely explosive. If you've ever seen a methamphetamine explosion, you wonder why they didn't use that instead of the atomic bomb. It costs about 300 to 500 per kilo to produce, and it can sell for $60,000 a kilo. Uh, methamphetamine has even uh, more pernicious effects uh, than heroin and cocaine. If you've ever seen a person heavily addicted, you see a person whose uh, nasal passages have rotted, whose teeth are falling out, whose uh, pharyngeal region is uh, absolutely destroyed, and whose lungs don't work very well. Very, very tough, bad drug. Nonetheless, it makes people feel good for a bit. There are lots of other costs of these drugs. I think the most serious cost that I see is the constitutional erosion. You know, two most serious things that have affected uh, individual liberty are drugs and the Patriot Act. And drugs, I think, are worse. Illegal drugs have vastly enlarged the criminal class and um, vastly increased the cost because it costs us $8 billion a year for just the drug offenders, not to mention other people in jail. There are medical costs for people who do want to get treatment. Uh, there are extreme political costs, especially negative ones, if you say, you know, I've read all the data. I've seen all the, uh, the reports. Uh, I'm looking at this as a medical problem. I don't think it should be a legal problem. Vote for me, and I'll do the best I can to make sure that happens. What do you think that politician's going to face at the polls? Yeah? Probably depends on where they're running. But like in the Deep South, they wouldn't be elected. They wouldn't be elected. Uh, and uh, what about in, in California, where a lot of people make a lot of money from the drugs? Same problem. Same thing in Washington, same thing in Oregon, same thing even in Montana. Now, you might get away with it in Massachusetts, although I doubt it, uh, given the present climate there. Remember the recent election. But uh, it's a sure loser for people to say, I'm for drugs. If you say, I'm against drugs, they're bad for the family, they're bad for the country, they're bad for cities. Uh, we shouldn't treat them as a medical problem. Put them in jail, off with their heads. That's a, that's a bigger winner than saying, you know, we better be reasonable about this. Yeah, go ahead. Well, but, and I think that's because you've had, you know, 70 or 80 years of, of a narrative that is very limited, but it's something, you know, people can remember just say no, or drugs, right. drugs equal bad, even if they, in fact, have done them. 
it's still easier to remember that, and it's it's easier to make a sound bite against yeah. someone who is exactly. trying to say something different. Don't confuse me with the facts. You know, I've heard what my politicians have to say, and that's easier for me to believe that than to think. Well, there are f fairly severe legal costs as well. Of course, if you get caught with drugs and you ha and you have to face uh, dealing with uh, the trial that goes with it and the jail sentence. Uh, that's very expensive. We spend a lot of money on that. And the personal costs, which we've talked to probably about enough. So there are some unintended consequences of the drug war. And I'll name a few. It's about $400 million in property that's seized each year without any charges that are brought under the civil asset uh, uh, forfeiture laws. You made this money. I'm taking it away because you're a drug dealer, uh, or I think you're a drug dealer, or I have a snitch that said you were a drug dealer. Hand it over. I'm taking your car. I'm taking your house. I'm taking your boat. You use this boat to transport drugs. Now, yes, I know we didn't find any trace of drugs in the boat, but I have a confidential informant that told me that that's what you did. I have your boat. Now, you can work hard to try to get your boat or your house or your money back. It doesn't work very well. The government has way, way too much power at both the state and the federal level. Pain is undertreated by physicians fearful of losing their licenses. And I told you about the Chronic Pain Act. And I'm told uh, by Dr. Robbins that uh, Stratton Hill uh, is going to appear before you at some point. And I hope at least one of you will ask him, Dr. Hill, could you tell us about the generation and the fight that you had to, to put up to get the Chronic Pain Act uh, into legislation and the regulations that made it work? Uh, and he will tell you a fascinating story. Now, I think he is a great man because he did that. There's a lot of poisoning and overdose because of adulterated and unregulated drugs that have a lot of junk in them, mostly because people want to increase the weight uh, and make more money for the weight, even though the drug is completely diluted or has uh, uh, adulterants. And of course, there's the spread of I HIV by dirty needles. You know, there have been a lot of campaigns to say, let's at least give people clean needles so we can stop uh, hepatitis, we can stop HIV. And uh, the drug warriors say, no, no, can't do that. that. That will encourage people to use drugs. We don't want to do anything to encourage people to engage in illegal activity. That's like saying sex education is bad. We don't want people engaging in sex. Well, it turns out they do anyway. There are no-knock searches under federal law ever since the Nixon administration. You don't have to have a warrant. If you have any kind of way that you can say there's a suggestion or a hint that drugs are inside that place, you can walk in without a knock, or you can break down the door, and you can say, give me your drugs, and if you're in the wrong place, you may say you're sorry, but maybe not. And a lot of people get hurt that way, and a lot of doors get knocked in. The link between drugs, yes, sir. I'm sorry, I had a, a question on the previous slide. Going back to pain is undertreated uh, by physicians. I was just, yeah. I've, I've seen uh, information and in literature on the, uh, well, methadone for opioid uh, abuse mainly due to uh, pain medication. Yeah. So it's kind of, a, it seems kind of counterintuitive. If physicians are indeed undertreating pain when so many people are strung out on pain, uh, pain medicine. Well, they're strung out on pain medicine because they took it for the psychoactive effect, not because they had a lot of pain. The people that use it for pain tend not to get the psychoactive effect, although there's a little bit of a crossover. So um, physicians uh, use painkillers they, because they have to, uh, but they tend to stay away from painkillers like methadone one, because of reputation, and two, because of uh, the fear that they have of uh, legal uh, either recrimination or, or pushback. D does that answer your question? Sure. I, I guess at one point I worked in a methadone clinic, and I would say 90% of the, of the clients there, due to being on a methadone. at one point uh, pain medication and because of pain, and it just kept going on. It got out of hand for them. It did, yeah and they couldn't find enough drug to be helpful. Or right. they couldn't get enough drug. Right, then it dealt into other illegal drug-seeking behaviors. Right. 
They, they couldn't get enough drug enough times or often enough to relieve the pain, so they went to stronger and stronger drugs. Methadone is sort of an end result. What were you going to say, Matt? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, let's see. We'll go to the next one. Come on. So we get violent crime by the consumers of drugs. We saw some statistics about that. Uh, and nonviolent crime as well. There's violent crime associated with the production and distribution of drugs. If you are in the business, uh, you don't want somebody else coming in and producing drugs that will compete with you. So the best way to get rid of them is either to kill them or to burn the farm or burn the plants. Uh, kidnap the family, do all kinds of threats. And that goes on regularly. There's violent crime to eliminate the competition. You know, instead of just destroying the farm, you kill the person that owned the farm and take it over yourself. And of course, there's violent crime associated with the attempt for enforcing drug prohibition. Uh, the police have a very, very hard job. Now, I've talked to a number of police. I've talked to sheriffs. I've talked to police officers. I've talked to Texas Rangers. I've talked to DE agents. And you get a, a sort of mixed result. Uh, the common feeling I get is they think the drug laws are crazy. It doesn't prevent them from going after them. There are some people, of course, who disagree with that. Drugs are bad, and they have a sort of uh, more religious bent in that case. And so uh, we want to keep them off the streets. We want to keep them out of our kids. We want to keep them away from our cities. Uh, so we'll do everything we can to uh, get the pushers and uh, put them away. And anybody who uses and we catch them will do the same thing. Other people think that this is a waste because they know the statistics about medical treatment. They know the fact that if this were treated as a medical problem as opposed to a legal problem, uh, we'd save ourselves a lot of grief. And so there's a very mixed feeling out there. Uh, if you talk to young officers who are just coming into uh, the problem, they tend to take a very rigid sort of almost militaristic stance. Drugs are bad. You talk to somebody who's more experienced and seen a lot and seen some of the misery and uh, has talked to people about it, you get a very different feeling. So the law enforcement community has, uh, I think, approached this in a, f in a fairly sensible way. They have a very tough job. They know that. And they're going to do the job because that's what the law is. That's what they have to do. They don't have a choice. But uh, sometimes they, they would admit, I think, they don't like it very much. So this is a graph of prisoners per 100,000 people in America. And you see that uh, by, by 2008, there were about 760 uh, people per thousand in jail uh, in the United States. Here are, uh, an, another, is another depiction of incarcerated Americans. Uh, and um, this is data that goes all the way back to 1920 and up to 2007. And you see a very interesting inflection point at around 1970, maybe 1972. And uh, that's labeled. Uh, in 1971, President Richard Nixon declared the war on drugs and began to put a lot more people in jail because of drug offenses, both users and distributors. And you see what's happened. It's uh, increased markedly, markedly. And there are some real problems that go with that increase. It turns out the United States is the world's leading jailer. We put more people in jail per population than in almost any other country. That includes Russia and South America, and uh, the least, of course, is uh, Japan. Now, here's a very interesting graph. It's uh, broken down uh, ethnically. It shows you, in the blue line at the far left, uh, about 74 people, or 74 percent of illicit drug users uh, are in the white population, and that's all, across all drugs, whereas um, the number of, uh, the percentage of people that go to jail is a little bit less than 20 percent. And you contrast that with uh, Hispanic population, where about 10 percent of the population is using drugs, not 74 percent, but about 25 percent, or 24 percent, are put in jail. And then you look at African Americans. Uh, African Americans are about 12 percent of the population, but they're uh, 55 percent of the population in jails. So I said African Americans are about 12% of the population. They're about 13% of the drug users. They represent 38%, three times as much, of drug arrests 
59% of convictions, and 74% longer sentences. Now, do um, you think there's a racial motivation there? Yeah. I, I don't see how anybody could look at that and not <laughs> just assume that there was. I mean, it's... I don't think anybody could look at it and not assume that there was, unless that person were uh, so convinced of uh, uh, moral purity that uh, w wouldn't look at the data. And um, we've come a long way with regard to uh, racial politics, but we still have a very, very long way to go. For instance, there are different sense guidelines for cocaine use. There's one sentence guideline for powder cocaine, which tend to be used by what, affluent people, more upper class people. And there's a very different sentence for uh, crack cocaine, which is used by people more in poverty. Do you know what the difference is? Yeah. I think it's like, well, I'm thinking of like the Rockefeller drug laws. Those were like by like a factor of 10. Like you could have 10 times the amount of the, s the same amount of cocaine to crack, like the same potency, yeah. you, would, you would be incarcerated at like a factor of like 10 times as much for crack yeah, cocaine. Now it's up to 100. F five to 500, a factor of 100. You use crack cocaine, you get uh, 100 times more of the sentence generally on the average than you do if you use powder cocaine. In 2008, there were approximately 15 million white Americans who'd used drugs in the previous month, compared to about 2.8 million African Americans. In other words, there were five times as many whites using drugs as African Americans, but about 10 times the number of African Americans that got sent to jail for longer sentences. So what are the factors in the drug war? Well, I think the primary factor, at least the one that comes across to me, is poverty and lack of opportunity and hopelessness and all that goes with that. Uh, those things were made not into social problems, not into economic problems, but into moral problems, and then into legal problems, not into medical problems. We know that medical treatment is 10 times more effective than incarceration. You know, study after study, statistic after statistic, which tends to get ignored, mostly because of politics and money. Money speaks very, very loud. The federal government and states now spend about, together, $50 billion per year on the drug war. Now here's a graph of uh, federal expenditures starting in 1991, and it started out at about $12 billion, and it, by 2009, it was up to about $23.5 billion. That's just the federal government. It's a little bit more than that by the states. The total last year, 2009, is about $50 billion. Now that's almost enough to bail out AIG. What a waste. So if you follow the money, who makes the money? Well, first of all, the producers and the distributors and the sellers all along that supply chain. And of course, private prison operators. You saw what happened when, uh, starting in 1971 when the prison population jumped. Well, a lot of those prisoners are not in federal or state jails. They're in private jails. And the people that run the private jails make a lot of money from them, maybe fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year expended on each prisoner. A lot of that is profit, maybe sixteen percent. The drug warriors themselves, the people who run the agencies, the people who work for the DEA, the, the local uh, uh, police, the state police, uh, and all the other federal agencies that are involved, including Homeland Security, and uh, that is the secure part of their budget. You know, one, uh, one second, when you are fighting for federal budget or state budget, and you have an argument about defending against the, the, the lethality or the criminality or the, the immorality of drugs, you get a very good argument and you probably get some money. Go ahead. Well, it would also seem like, well, I know with the, the private prison operators, they have lobbyists. So they're, oh, sure. you know, there's not just a vested interest, but they're actively protecting their interest in Congress. But also, um, looking at your earlier slides with just how it breaks down racially, I mean, it's a pretty effective way of controlling minority populations um, that you can, at, and I think people do make a claim, is not racist. Oh, it's not racist, but you know, we're, we're throwing all these people in jail. But 
they can try to sidestep that argument. Right. So I'll, t I'll tell you a conversation I had with, uh, I guess he was 12 at the time, a kid here in Houston, in Fourth Ward, African American. And I, uh, I met him because uh, I was involved in a program for trying to find alternatives to jail for youthful offenders, nonviolent offenders. He was a nonviolent offender. And he was in a, a, a sort of a correctional program. Uh, very, very bright kid. And I said, what, you know, what do you want to do with this experience? And he said, well, he said, I don't really have a whole lot of choice. That's what it came down to. I can go back and I can flick burgers for $5 an hour or whatever it is. Uh, or I can go back on the street and make about 100 times that. And I need to support my family. I have a brother and, a, and two sisters. I think that's what it was. And my mother's sick. My father's gone. Uh, I need the money. And this is the only way I can get it. You know, I'm pretty good at it. I know what I did to get caught. I won't get caught again. No, he didn't want a minimum wage job. Uh, he wasn't getting anywhere in school, although he was very bright. Uh, and I said, well, what about school? He said, I, you know, the school I go to is terrible. You know, they don't have enough books. Uh, the teachers are bad. Uh, the, everybody's cutting up in class. You can't learn a thing. You know, I learn a lot more on the street than I learn in school. And that's not an uncommon story. And I said, well, I, I wish I could do something to help change your mind. He said, I wish you could, too. He didn't like that life. He knew it was risky. He knew that he'd probably die before he got to 25, or he'd be in jail for a third of his life. Uh, I said, what about jail? And he said, well, uh, jail's like uh, sort of high school and college for us. You know, that's where you learn the tricks of the trade. It's a sort of a uh, rite of passage to go to jail. Now, that's a sad commentary. The people who make a lot of money without doing a whole lot of work are the people who launder the drug uh, money. Uh, a lot of banks do that, and it's estimated now that about 25 percent, or 25 cents of every dollar uh, in drug profit goes to the launderers. And there are lots of techniques for laundering money. You know, you use false businesses, and you can cook the books, and it's very, very hard to catch, especially when you go back and forth inside and outside the country. Uh, have a bank account in the Cayman Islands, have another bank account in uh, Liechtenstein, uh, and you have a business that uh, has a constant movement in various kinds of goods, none of which really appears, but that's what's on the books. Hard for the DEA to spot that. They do, but not very much. So there's corrupt law enforcement personnel. Um, very hard to resist if you see a pile of cash that you're about to confiscate from a drug dealer, uh, and there are a couple hundred thousand dollars there not to take some of it and stick it in your pocket. Because police don't make enough money. I mean. I don't know how many of you know police or have any experience with police, but it's one of the worst jobs in the world. One of the hardest, one of the most dangerous. Uh, don't get paid nearly enough. And so they're subject to uh, corruption, uh, not to mention other people in law enforcement, including lawyers and judges. Uh, I, I have a, I won't say a friend, I have an associate, a, an acquaintance who defends people on drug charges, uh, mostly alcohol. And I said, how can you do it? You know, they, this guy's killed a family. He said, well, he deserves representation. I said, I understand that. You know, I know that's a principle of the law, but how do you, you yourself, justify doing it? He said, well, somebody's got to do it, and it's very lucrative. And there's the operative phrase. So uh, the last person on my list are the confidential informants, the snitches. And they make a fair amount of money, although uh, I guess there are better ways to make a living, by um, telling on people, sometimes truthfully, sometimes not. There was a case in Texas not too long ago, you may remember. A whole town, or half a whole town, was accused by a confidential informant of being involved in a drug trade. Turns out none of it was true. No, do you remember that? You're, I'm just laughing because it's you're laughing because? They don't remember it. Yeah, no, okay. Uh, and uh, it turned out this guy was a complete fraud. He was a former drug dealer himself, which is why he knew the language that he had to use to convince law enforcement. But the people in the town, the sheriff, etc., were uh, adamant about the fact that they wanted no drugs in that town, and they arrested people left and right. It took about three years for people to get cleared, and then a lot of money, which they never got back. So what can be done? And we're getting very close to the end. <laughs> She's smiling. Well, we could try decriminalizing drugs. 
we could use the statistics and we could use the data, we could use the studies uh, that make the case for a medical treatment as, as opposed to jail. We could use the idea that you put people in jail and you make them lifetime criminals. We could use the idea that uh, we're spending far too much money on putting people behind bars and wasting their lives and costing us money. We take them out of society. Uh, we don't ever rehabilitate them, really. We just make them better criminals. And we could avoid that by decriminalization. We certainly could avoid it by legalization. And we could tax it. Now, here's the state of California, which is broker than broke. And I don't think it's any accident that uh, medical marijuana is now uh, resurgent in uh, California, and people in the legislature are talking about taxing it. Why? They need the money. Money speaks. We can use taxation and uh, raise some money that we probably need. There's a lot of social pressure that we could exert. Uh, we'd rather have you go to school than uh, be in jail. So here's what we're going to do. You know, we're going to put you in this program. We're going to get you off the drugs. We're going to teach you about nutrition. We're going to teach you how to read better. Uh, we're going to teach you some skills so you can get a job. That's a lot more effective than putting people in jail. There's a lot of economic pressure we can exert. Although it's difficult to combat the extraordinary amount of money that's on the side of the illegal drugs. But we could try. And of course, there are all kinds of restrictions, especially in employment. Uh, if you use drugs, um, we're not going to give you the job. We're not going to let you keep your job. Now, I've seen that work uh, sometimes reasonably well. Sometimes it's excessive. But uh, an employer has the right to say, I don't want anybody working for me that shows up drunk or high or who uses drugs. Now, of course, there are people who say, I only smoke marijuana on the weekends, never at work. Uh, nonetheless, doesn't pass the drug pest. Marijuana is a very pernicious drug. It gets into your fat cells and it stays for a long time and it's easily detectable. Alcohol, also detectable, although on a much shorter range. Cocaine and heroin, somewhere in the middle. But employers can say, no job for you if you take drugs. Well, if people need the job, and now they do, that might be a very strong inducement to stay away from the drug of choice. And there are licensing restrictions. We already know about what happens to your driver's license, or can, if you drink alcohol and drive. Uh, we can also do the same thing with other professional licenses. If you're a lawyer uh, and you're uh, adjudicated as having used drugs, and there's even the hint that that caused you to do something bad for your client, you lose your license, and that's proper. A uh, little bit tougher with doctors, especially because they treat pain, but there could be some restrictions there. I don't think we probably do enough about that, but uh, that's coming. And I told you about the License Bureau of the Future, where we look at people and uh, test their biochemical properties and propensities and determine what will be the effect if indeed they are caught with any drug in the bloodstream. Uh, I'm not sure that will ever happen, but it's scientifically possible. So uh, in uh, summary, and I have three minutes left, Addiction and drug abuse is, in my view, uh, primarily a medical problem. But it's been made into a moral problem and then a legal problem. The drug war was initiated not because of the dangers of drugs, they are dangerous, but to provide weapons against racial minorities and political opponents. And the drug war is increasingly all about money. And um, with that recognition, I thank you for your attention and participation, and we're done. Any last questions? You can clap if you want. <laughs> thank you very much. I'd like to thank Dr. Robbins for inviting me. And uh, I will look forward to the next session, which I'm not sure when it will be. And we'll talk more about uh, some of the legalities and the issues related there, too. So um, save up your questions, and we'll try it again. Any last comments?